Good evening and welcome to the Committee of the Whole meeting for September 14th, 2022, and we're beginning right at 6 p.m. Uh, at this time, I'd like to confirm the agenda. Are there any emergent items from any of the councillors for tonight's Committee of the Whole? Seeing and hearing none, anything from administration? Uh, thank you, Worship and Council. Administration's requesting that Council add uh, Council CAO dialogue advice from officials. Web section 24-1A as 7.1. Thank you. I'll, I'll move the agenda as amended. Thank you for that motion. I'll call the question. All in favor? And that motion is carried. This brings us to delegations 3.1, uh, Marigold Library System. Uh, Lynn Price is here with us. We'd like to welcome you officially and congratulate you on uh, your new position as CAO of Marigold Library System. And uh, we look forward to hearing and seeing your presentation tonight. Thank you, Mayor Fuel and Council, for providing time for me to speak this evening. And to the uh, Strathmore uh, staff, Jonathan and Chris, for, for uh, in the invitation, extending the invitation, and for setting me up today. So it will not surprise you that I believe library service is the heart of every community. Public libraries provide a safe, inclusive space and our community hubs for learning and literacy and recreation. Your municipality's investment in Marigold membership is good business for your community and residents. Many of you have toured Marigold headquarters, which is a centralized operational hub um, that works behind the scenes to support public library service. So today, I'll highlight Marigold services and support to demonstrate how being a part of Marigold allows your municipality to provide more to residents than could be accomplished alone. So I would say that for everyone, the last couple of years has definitely brought change, and that includes many positive changes for Marigold. We are so grateful to the town for your support during the building of our new facility with the Western Irrigation District. Your support played a role in helping us continue seamless service during the pandemic, the transition back to working on site, and our move. <laughs> so we had no doubt time in terms of providing service to our member libraries. So one of the primary services that Marigold provides is centralized purchasing, receiving, and processing of physical library collections. We get more for our dollar by negotiating substantial discounts and free shipping through bulk purchasing. We purchased over 3,000 new items for Strathmore Library last year, and over $1.1 million was spent on brand new collection materials across the system. So Strathmore cardholders have access to all of that. At headquarters, we receive, order, process materials into a database for patrons to discover. Marigold is a part of the TRAC consortium with three other regional library systems. And as a result, every cardholder in Strathmore has access to 3.2 million items in a shared library collection. Libraries can only fit so many items on shelves. And sharing collections with TRAC means not every library has to have everything, which is really efficient and environmentally friendly and cost effective. So this is what I mean when I say that we can provide more to Strathmore uh, than possibly a municipality could do alone with the 645,000 e-books and 154,000 e-audiobooks. Those alone would cost, I'd say at a minimum, $5 million to, to replicate if the collection were built from scratch. We also provide unique collections like pedometers or Fortis power monitors. Um, we've added hundreds of unique items for libraries to share and circulate locally, including telescopes and trekking poles, museum passes, and more. We have also provided large print collections for print-disabled patrons. Um, we actually were providing large print collections to the Wheatland Lodge in collaboration with the Strathmore Library staff, and that was suspended during the pandemic, and I would really like to see that start up again. So we will be reaching out to them. Marigold staff work behind the scenes to ensure services and resources are affordable and sustainable. When a teenager uses Hoopla to Digital to download comics, or your dad's looking up how to fix his car on auto repair, this happens because Marigold staff have reviewed and negotiated licensing and contracts. We provide training resources and promotional materials so library patrons and staff know about the products that we have, but also how to use them. And we provide free apps so cardholders can request, borrow, and download collections and e-resources from anywhere. 
Our staff serve on vendor and provincial working groups and have a strong voice in identifying areas for improvement, including uh, participation in software development and enhancement. Our collaboration on working groups means more people are making frontline customer service the best it can be for your residents. And as, as, in, as today, <laughs> we come to you. Um, so we don't sit behind our desks. We have a fleet of seven vehicles uh, to support resource sharing, outreach, programming, project work, and on-site IT support. Our drivers are on the road five days a week to deliver more than 2.3 million interlibrary loans that get sorted through our fabulous sorter at headquarters. We drive 300,000 kilometers each year to transport supplies, kits and games, equipment, and more. Delivery is such an essential service component that we completed a GIS analysis in 2020 to ensure the efficiency of our delivery routes. And we also have greening features embedded in our software that keep physical library items as close to home as possible. So your items fill for your patrons first. And that also helps reduce volume in our vans. Marigold staff assist libraries with project work like inventory, which ensures the items on library shelves are in good condition and topical and relevant. We recycle worn out books and decommission IT for library staff, which saves them time. We also have a unique traditional service called Library to You. So we mail items requested by patrons to their post box. Two dozen residents in Strathmore currently receive books, movies, or audiobooks mailed to them from headquarters. We include Canada Post return labels so your residents don't incur extra costs. So this is, to me, a really small but important original service from 1981 because it ensures equity for homebound and, and uh, remote patrons. And I think it's clear, clear to everybody that access to technology has, and digital content has never been so integrated with everyday life. Um, Marigold provides the technology that allows people to interact with the library in the way that they find the most useful and effective. And this is made possible by our secure network infrastructure. So at the library, patrons have access to public computers and wireless networks that connect them with the world at large. These systems are kept safe, secure, and optimized by Marigold IT to ensure users have the most positive experience possible. We provide libraries with centralized system configuration, remote management, collaborative tools, a robust security framework, and shared software packages. Full service IT support maximizes uptime and minimizes the need for additional staff at the library. We also provide and support the library software, Polaris. This software enables library staff to, to create and maintain patron accounts, share collections, generate statistics, and manage inventory. And we also provide libraries with full featured websites and apps. I really like this quote from Rachel, so I thought I would include it in the presentation. But we have three full-time IT staff, and hopefully soon to be four, that provide rapid help desk and on-site support, saving thousands of dollars each year for libraries. IT staff make regular visits to member libraries to update and maintain their equipment. Um, we all know that the risk of cyber attacks for public institutions continues to rise. So all IT services include a strict eye on security and safe access to information. We also provide a comprehensive suite of online resources that patrons can access from their home or really anywhere in the world. Um, and in 2021, 6,519 people or families from Strathmore had track cards, which is pretty astounding percentage-wise. There are some of the things, these are some of the things a library cardholder can do with our e-resources. Um, but what I like the most about them, because when I look at that, I think, okay, why couldn't I just look that up on a YouTube video? But this is a credible and safe and ad-free environment, which I think is really great for teens as well as, as parents. So Marigold creates and provides libraries with programming, programming materials to use in-house, like traveling displays of uh, young adult book awards, um, giant board games, and craft kits. Candy Sushi is a perennially popular program with teens. We also provide consulting services on the technological needs of the library and help libraries position for ever-changing technologies and trends. We provide a $1,000 technology spending account to Strathmore each year, plus email, 
file sharing and centralized backup, Microsoft 365 products, patron printing software, and a toll-free telephone system. We provide support for library managers on completing provincial statistics and reports required by legislation, management and leadership, volunteer stewardship, and human resources. We also provide discounts to member libraries on IT equipment, office supplies, furniture, and process, processing supplies, and basically any item required for the daily operation of the library. We provide communication and marketing support through professional quality publications, displays, and we also have a software called Libraryware where libraries can generate their own um, promotional materials for services and events. So, I, would, I know that economic development is a very important thing for Strathmore as well as other communities. And we know that libraries contribute to the economic development through, sorry, to economic development through employment and business activities and are a draw to residents who are deciding whether or not to move to a different community. So we strive behind the scenes to ensure the experience of Strathmore residents is positive and beneficial and maximizes every dollar invested. And that was everything I wanted to present to you today, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lynn, for your uh, attendance and your presentation. And what I really like with your final comment was you tied it right into one of our strategic planning uh, sections, which Thank is you. on the uh, ECDEV. So I appreciate that and, and the wellness that uh, libraries contribute to. That's one of our strategic uh, items as well. So. Um, I've always been so impressed. I was glad to be a part of the, the library board and go to the Marigold AGMs and different things. But I was, um, I've always been impressed with the things that the library tries and does that are, you know, it's thinking outside the box and, and coming up with new things that can be checked out of a library, new programs, things to uh, attract and hold young people's attention. So. Uh, thank you to Marigold and, and to all the libraries, especially our own public library here. Uh, Councillor Deputy Mayor Peterson. Thank you, Lynn, and, and uh, goes without saying my uh, my admiration for, for Marigold and for your you and your group. One of the one of the questions I have is is very politically motivated, and I know that in um, in 2017, uh, Strathmore Council took a resolution to the province to the AUMA uh, advocating that, um, that, you know, that regional libraries should be, uh, be able to act uh, as statutory groups in, in the sense that they could then um, access the same kind of funding from an economic stance that, that other entities could because you, you now are under the Public Library Services Board auspice and you can't act in that independent way. So it was a big barrier at the time to finding uh, resources to, to be able to build the library. One of the things that I'll never forget was that when that, um, when that motion came to the floor under that particular um, uh, council that we had at that time, uh, it, it failed on the floor. But the deputy um, premier of the time came down and said to me, what do you mean libraries can't act independently? And, and then shortly thereafter, they sent you a check for $3 million, mm -hmm. which helped in the build. So my question is, is, is it still a viable concern that, that libraries have that designation? Would it, would it be useful? Um, and, 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 and if it's a conversation for another day, I'm, I'm happy with that. But I always think about um, what the future might bring in terms of, because I, I don't see you lessening your scope anytime soon. It's going to continue to grow, uh, particularly in the fast-paced world we live in. And, and there may be additional needs in, in terms of, of what we're talking about um, from an economic perspective. So in some ways, I think the way that we are legislated and structured helps us, and in others, it's harmful um, because we, one example is with our current headquarters, we are not able to lease that building because it can only be used for the purposes of a library system and we are being held to that very right. specific piece of legislation. Um, 
So, and, and at the same time, we are also held at 2016 municipal affairs uh, population, which is decided yeah. specifically by municipal affairs public library services branch. Um, one thing, I don't quite have an answer for you, but what I will say is that since Jasper Conference um, was suspended a few years ago. That was an Alberta-wide library conference and attracted people from across Canada. Um, but it was an opportunity for us to meet with the Minister of Municipal Affairs and other ministers and advocate for regional library systems. Um, because that hasn't happened, I feel that's been a, a very big gap in our visibility with the province. Um, and it would be fantastic for us to try and build in to somebody's platform, an advocacy. an advocacy strategy for increasing funding across the province. So the system directors and chairs are meeting October 13th in, um, in Lacombe at the Parkland Regional System, and we hope to develop something that we can roll out, uh, not just at the system level, but to each library and raise our voices together. Um, Calgary and Edmonton have expressed their desire for increased funding recently um, to the minister. Um, but of course, they have, I think, some different needs as, a, as large urban systems than, than uh, some of our smaller communities. So I hope we can find a balance. And, and I believe that we are stronger when we speak up at the same time. Stronger together. That's, I think that's a, a brilliant path forward. And I would I'd strongly encourage you to talk to our CEO. He has some, some very, very uh, good information around, around the strength of advocacy and has tremendous experience in that. So, yeah, thank and you. The last thing I'd like to say, Your Worship, with regards to Marigold is that they have acted on the leading edge of, of um, bringing library services into the fullness of community in an inclusive way. And I'm very proud of the work that they've done with the Indigenous communities that fall within the realm of Marigold. And there are t typically three um, uh, indigenous communities. And I really believe that uh, al although I know that you don't have enough money, that you haven't done as much as you wanted to do, and, and that there have been all kinds of challenges, but you have done an amazing amount of work with a very small amount of resource. And I believe that because of the work that you've done, that you've brought uh, a hopefulness to those indigenous communities. And I really believe that in the next five years, we're going to see libraries. Uh, in those communities, and and it's my fervent hope that they will uh, become a part of the um, of the Marigold Library System, and and I really appreciate um, what you do in our community and in theirs, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Peterson. Um, I have Councillor Langmaid and then Councillor Mitzner. Thank you, Your Worship. Lynn, it's good to see you here. I don't think it's a I don't think it's a secret to anyone that I'm I'm a big fan of libraries myself and I'm a big fan of what Marigold does, not only for our community here in Strathmore, but but for the entire region that you cover, which is vast. Uh, if anyone is, isn't aware, Marigold covers now let's see if I can get Airdrie South? Do we go we no, we go further Three north Hills, than Airdrie. Consort. Um, on sort. All the way to ID9, Lake Louise, to special areas to the Saskatchewan border, and then south to Longview, High River. Yes, so. the, the area that you serve is absolutely massive, which just speaks to the level of impact that you have, not only on our community, but, but all communities throughout southern Alberta. And, and I want to recognize you and just say how wonderful the work that you do is. Um, early, early when we were first elected uh, to this council, we were invited to come on a tour to the Marigold Library building. And I can't remember who said this, but it stuck with me since. And, and it's true, it's that the Marigold and libraries aren't afraid to try something and have it not work. <laughs> you know, you're, you're always open to trying new things, building new programs and, and putting it out there to see how people respond. And you know that what works in one community might not work in another. And I think that that's just a beautiful, a beautiful way to operate and just go, you know what, we're, we're gonna try and see how it goes. And sometimes things catch and sometimes things don't, but that creativity and the, and the, and the variety of, of programming and materials that you bring in is, is just incredible. And, Thank you for the work. Thank you for the work that you do here. And I don't really have any questions for you. I just wanted to talk you up. So thanks so much for being in our community. And I'm really proud to be on the on the board with you. And Marigold's wonderful. Thank you for the work thank that you. you do. Thank you, Councillor Langmaid. Councillor Mitzner. 
Um, I have a question. Do you see uh, our library as being too small right now and needing additional square footage for our present library? I can't believe that I get the opportunity to answer that question, so thank you for asking. Um, there are standards established by the province as to uh, community size versus the square footage in a library. And I would say that every library that could expand, that has an opportunity to expand, will use the space. Um, I also understand there are financial restrictions and logistical restrictions just in terms of what facility may be available or you know, if you're talking about retrofitting or a new build. Um, every time, I think libraries need to plan for the next 10 to 20 years. And in that way, from what I see with the growth in Strathmore, that I would recommend that be a consideration to have as a future discussion. Okay, and can you just expand a bit on where you said there's no lease options for you, where you're at? So yeah. what type of leases would you be looking for? So we, our only choice is to sell our old facility at 710 Second Street or to use it. We are not allowed to lease it to a third party to generate revenue until we sell it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, or even as a long-term solution. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mitzner. Any other questions or comments for Lynn, uh, Councillor Montgomery? Thank you. Um, so just following that line of questioning, so is it, is it possible for a library to go into the Marigold building? It is, it is not because we are closed to the public. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments, questions for Lynn? Seeing none. Thank you again very much for your presentation. Best wishes as you move forward with Marigold and uh, your support of rural libraries. I hope to see all of you in the community cross paths with you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you, and uh, now that the delegation has presented and we've had a chance to uh, ask questions and, and, and make some positive comments towards Lynn and her group, uh, I just wanted to take a, a moment to reflect on the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. If you're watching from home, I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, uh, the Queen's portrait has been draped in black and our flags at the town office are at half mask and they will remain at half-mast for the remainder of the morning period until sunset on September 19th. Uh, I think many of us uh, understand and are appreciative that Queen Elizabeth II dedicated her life to public service. She remained active in her duties as a monarch, as our monarch for over seven decades and Canada was very dear to her. She traveled across our country several times and met with Canadians to hear our stories. And on behalf of the town of Strathmore, uh, my fellow councillors, and the residents of Strathmore, I offer my deepest sympathies to the members of the royal family. And before we get on to the business of tonight's meeting, I would like to take a moment of silence in honour of Queen Elizabeth II. Thank you. We move now to the confirmation of minutes, item 4.1, Committee of the Whole Meeting Minutes for July 13th, 2022. Councillor Langmaid. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to move that Council adopt the July 13th, 2022, Committee of the Whole Meeting Minutes as presented. Thank you for that motion. All in favor? And that motion is carried. We move now to tonight's business, item 5, 5.1, Traffic Control Bylaw Number 22-06. Claudette, welcome. Thank you, Your Worship. Good evening. Good evening, councillors. It's been a while. <laughs> Hope you guys had a good summer. Today I'm here to present um, the Traffic Control Bylaw again. I was here last March, Committee of the Whole Meeting. 
and took back some feedback from councillors and made the changes necessary. And does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Claudette. I had one question about e-bikes and um, I'm trying to find it in my notes again. Um, now, every person riding a bicycle, e-bicycle, scooter, e-scooter, uh, upon a sidewalk shall yield the right of way to pedestrians. All of this is fine, but I'm, I'm just wondering if other communities, maybe even larger communities, are, are they experiencing difficulties as far as the speed that e-bikes can have, and should they be allowed on sidewalks at all? Have you heard or read anything as far as other communities go? Thank you. I have not read anything um, pertaining to that, but I know in larger communities they do have designated bike lanes where typically that's where those scooters are used. Um, and when they don't, they are on the sidewalk. I used to work downtown Calgary and that's what you would see. You'd see them on the sidewalk or in the bicycle lanes. But I can look into that and get back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions from councillors? Councillor Dangmaid. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a few, so I'll start with a couple thoughts and then I'll give someone else a chance uh, before I move on. Uh, just some, I'll start with just some generic thoughts as I was reading through it. Um, and these don't really have much to do with the actual content, but uh, just grammar and consistency. Things are capitalized in weird places all over the place in the document. So if we can just work on some grammar and consistency and, and I know we have a gender neutral statement like this bylaw is gender neutral. And if we could actually uh, use gender neutral language, that would be good. There's a couple hymns and hers and himselfs in there that I think we can just clean up. Um, the first question that I have is actually about the scooters. And that is, uh, um, Scooter is a term that can kind of mean a few different things. So when I hear scooter, I can think of, I think what's referred to in here is like a moped. As a kid, I called those scooters. Then there's also like the razor scooters that are push, like kids pushing down the road. Then there's mobility scooters and e-scooters. And then what about like, like the, uh, there's just there's a few different things and if, and I read as I was reading through the document I thought you know the scooter is a bit ambiguous I think we could probably use a, a, a bit more of a definition on that one um, and then the uh, another um, question that came out when I reviewed this is around recreational vehicles and trailers um, so where I struggled with this was a trailer is considered a trailer when it's not attached to a vehicle. If the trailer is attached to a vehicle, from what I understand from reading this, it's considered a vehicle. So therefore, a, 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 a trailer attached to a truck could sit on the road for up to 72 hours as long as it remains attached to the truck. Is that correct? That's not supposed to be how the bylaw is interpreted. Okay, we might want to look at that then because okay. it just says, you know, uh, let's see if I can actually find the right section here that I'm looking at. Um, trailer, yeah, it says, shall be subject to the rec regulations pertaining to vehicles. So that to me says that a, a trailer attached to a truck should be treated just like a vehicle. And then it's also a little confusing because it says no driver shall park any trailer or permit any trailer to be parked upon a highway unless the trailer is attached to a vehicle. And then in 16.3 it says an owner or driver of a trailer shall not park a trailer on the highway for more than 24 hours. But in two points before it says that you can't do it at all but what if it's attached to a vehicle? <laughs> and then, you know, why would we have, a, you know, from an eyesore and inconvenience standpoint, is a truck attached to a trailer any less of a nuisance for other people that are trying to find parking in a, in a community than, say, an RV? You know, a recreational vehicle. It's also long and large and takes up a lot of street space. So I'm not, there seems to be different rules for the three categories, for the two different categories, for trailers and RVs and things. And I think we could just maybe make it a little more clear. Or maybe I've read it wrong <laughs> and you can help me understand it better now. 
I'll take a look over it. Um, when I read it, I guess in my mind, I know exactly what it's supposed to mean. Um, yeah, but if you have questions, everybody's going to have questions. So I can take a look back at that, um, make sure that the definitions are more clear. Yeah, it was just that that section really kind of tripped me up, and I, 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 I'm actually not even sure I could tell you what the rule is right now. So if we could look at that section. And then I'll take a I'll break here and give someone else an opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Langmaid. Councillor Montgomery. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, so many of my uh, points are actually just kind of rehashed of the, when we first kind of reviewed this. Um, so with 8.7, for instance, section 8.7, uh, it, it deals with uh, if there's like a mess left on the road, um, you know, the town is able to come and clean it up or if there's a mess left on the sidewalk, you know, dirt or something like that. But 8.7 basically is, is stating that we do not assume any sort of responsibility, you know, for damage done to anyone's property while uh, we're cleaning up the mess. Uh, and the point that I raised last time, and I'll just raise it again, um, you know, if, if some guy, you know, dumps some dirt in front of my house and the town comes to clean it up and then, you know, they, they crash into my truck or, you know, they rip up my lawn, um, I, I'm, I'm surprised that we can legally absolve ourselves of, of being responsible for that. Um, and so, and this is what I asked last time is, that can we confirm that we legally can absolve ourselves from damaging somebody's property um, if they're totally unrelated to the situation? Is that, is that the case? I would say no. Um, we can take that out of there, if you, out of the bylaw, if you wish. It's just when there's debris blocking traffic on the road, the highway. Yep. Typically, we ask the individual like how long it's going to be there. Um, it's no different than a sea can, right? That's parked. Um, if they don't comply, it's up to us then to hire a contractor or our staff to clean it up. Typically, you have that good contractor who isn't in there just to damage your stuff. And if it's damaged, we ask that they would replace it. That's all. I mean, I'm not going to say, yeah, you can go in and damage it, and it's back on the town for that. I mean, that's kind of disrespectful. And it would go right back to the company. It's their. OK. Um, they, like, And if the town hires a contractor, the town is not at all responsible for the damage that would be done by the contractor? So the contractor bills the property owner for that cleanup if they don't comply to clean it up within a certain period of time. So they don't bill the town, they would bill the property owner directly? Well, they, sorry, they bill the town and then the town sends the land owner, the okay. registered owner, the bill. Okay. Yeah, so I, I would just, and again, like my, I, I totally get the part about if somebody leaves a mess and, and, you know, and you give them, you know, ask them to clean it up. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that in a situation where somebody's property is damaged, I just, if we, if we can't actually legally absolve ourselves of, of responsibility, then we probably, you know, shouldn't have it in the bylaw saying we don't assume any sort of responsibility for damage done to people's property while we're doing that. That would be the contractor to replace the damage that was done. I'm wondering if I could turn to our CAO, uh, Kevin Scoble, and your experiences with other communities. Is it typical that the, the, the municipality would, uh, would not be liable for damages in a situation that's described by Councillor Montgomery, where we're absolved? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm fully understanding the situation, but like, like if it was a town project, <laughs> and we were doing construction and a contractor did some damage in our contract, they would be responsible for it, okay? And it would typically be covered by insurance, just like if, if we cause damage, it would be covered by insurance as well. So if I heard the example right, and, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, but somebody causes a mess on the road and we go in and to clean it up, I mean, if if if, our, our backhoe or our, our skid steer or whatever we were using contacted a resident's vehicle parked there, then that would be handled as any motor vehicle accident, right? Like it would be administered through insurance and that. And that's kind of what I thought I heard, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's accurate. 
Right, and, and so that's that's what I'm saying. I, I, I'm I'm confused why we would be stating we don't you know assume any responsibility for damage done if you know there is a normal process you know for if we damage somebody's property usually we would you know like you said go through insurance or have some sort of a process rather than just saying you know tough luck our bylaw says we're not responsible for damage done while we're cleaning up a mess on the road and that's that's what the bylaw is saying it's saying we're not responsible and that's so I'm just I'm. I, I think either if that's true, that's fine. Um, then we can leave it in there. I'm just I'm, I'm saying if we are responsible, we should not have that in the bylaw. Yeah, I think uh, I'm just trying to understand because that clause relates back eight seven relates back to eight five, but then that yeah. goes back to eight three and eight four. So I was trying to trying to catch up here. So I don't know, Claudette, if you're more versed in those clauses right now. Your Worship. That, that's what I that, that I think that it's a contextual issue because I, I think that if you read 8.7 in the context of 8.5 and 8.6 then it doesn't read that the town is devoid or, or is avoiding you know it, it's contextual they all depend on one another and it states in 8.7 that, that 8.5 and 8.6 are relevant, and then 8.5 and 8.6 reference 8.3 and 8.4. So I think when you read it and take it in its entirety, I don't know that the town is absolving themselves of responsibility. I don't think so. Just where it says that uh, like it includes the property that is abutting the highway or sidewalk. Um, so like I said, if, if the mess is on the sidewalk in front of my property and... It's not my fault. Um, therefore, it's it's not the property that's causing obstruction. Um, I, I, I just uh, the way it reads, it's saying that we can, if the mess is in front of your house, even if you're not responsible for it, uh, if any damage occurs while it's being cleaned up, uh, the town assumes no responsibility. Um, Maybe I could provide a different explanation of yep. along a pathway. Somebody now has, say, a cement garden bed. It was never permitted to be there. There's no permit for it to be built right on the sidewalk on the town's property. If they take their snow blower there to clear out the path, snow removal, and they scrape that, the town shouldn't be liable to fix that cement flower bed if it wasn't supposed to be there. Yeah, in that situation, I completely, I, I, yeah, you're right um, that... That's just not the way this. Like I, I under, the way I understood this is we was discussing messes left on on the road or the sidewalk, um, and and responsibility for that. Um, I'll, th I'll I'll think about what you guys have said a bit more, and uh, you know if it's uh, if I need more clarification or something like that, I'll, I'll bring that forward. I guess. So closing out, is it fair to say, like I, I when I read this, it's it's damage caused by other parties, and we go in to clean it up. And we're, the town is not going to be responsible for the damage from those other parties. If, in the course of cleaning that up, we caused some damage, we would accept, we would be accountable for that. Is that is that fair, Claudette? That's correct. That's yeah. how it's supposed yeah. to be written. So, if there was damage done by a contractor going in, it would go back to the contractor to fix that damage up. If the town was to do it, I mean, we would fix what we could as well. But we're not going to assume any liability if the contractor does the damage no legally if we if we're the ones hiring the contractor doesn't that make us kind of the prime contractor in that case uh, um yeah it, well it would depend whether we were the prime contractor or not it would also depend on what the contract documents between the town and the contractor yeah. i mean normally it says in there that they're they're responsible and they absolve the town of of any okay. damages they cause um, okay yeah. That's okay. not to say if there was a lawsuit, the town wouldn't get named as, as a third party. Um, you know, I'll be frank, it's the, always the deep pockets that get, get named as well, so. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate that clarification. Um, and I guess if nobody else wants to go, I'll jump in again. Or do you want to go? Well, I think I have three sentences left. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next one is just 9.2, and, I, and I, again, I mentioned this one previously, but so it discusses like signs um, that, you know, say for street cleaning where it says, you know, don't park on this street from, you know, say September 15th to, you know, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. or something like that. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way this 
reads, it's saying that you cannot park on the road from the time a sign or signs have been placed and until the signs have been removed. Um, so again, if, if we put the signs out two days before the street cleaning, the way this reads, in my understanding is that as soon as the signs are out, regardless of what's on the sign, you cannot park on that road until those signs are gone. I can make changes to that. Thank you. And uh, so and then the next one is uh, 17.2. Um, <laughs> And it just has to do with uh, somebody parking a recreational vehicle. It says an owner or driver of a recreational vehicle shall not park the recreational vehicle on a highway unless it is parked in a location immediately adjoining the recreational vehicle owners or operators place of residence as shown in the records of, of Alberta Registry. So basically it's saying you cannot park a, an RV in front of anybody's home but your own. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the issue that that creates is that, you know, if I have somebody coming in from out of town, they can't park their motor, like they literally couldn't, nobody coming in from out of town can park their motor home anywhere in any residential area essentially uh, because they're not the registered owner of the property. Um, I think we should probably have some sort of leeway that, you know, allows people, no, obviously not park it over. Says we don't condition it to Correct. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's that's okay. Thank you very much. I, I uh, missed that part, obviously. Um, okay. Thank you. Then you must have heard me last time, I guess. Okay. And and the only one that I, I have, of course, is well. I guess I could, <laughs> This is going to be kind of a silly question, of course, but uh, is do we intend that people should follow this bylaw? Um, yeah, do we intend that people should should follow this bylaw the way it is written, is my question. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, so we have we have a section, and I'll just, let me just reread this in case I'm, I'm missing something here. Um, okay, so it says no person shall, no, number 12.4, shall ride a bicycle or, or any wheeled device essentially. <laughs> Um, on private property without the express prior written consent of the property owner. Um, now, last time you mentioned that that was not really intended to be followed, uh, that it was kind of left to the discretion of the, the peace officer or the bylaw officer. Um, so in, I, I, I think, and this is the issue that I raised last time is, well, and I guess maybe you can, should I just bring this as an amendment to the next meeting when we look at this, I guess, if I want it changed? So I think last meeting you referred to a kid riding their bike in a Walmart parking lot mm -hmm. when we pulled them over. That's actually a private parking lot with public access. So it's not private property? It's private property with public access. Okay. Um, so private property is say a company in town they have posted private property no trespassing that yeah. is private property no public access yep yeah. so that's correct uh, schools would be private property public access so that would mean private property public access they could ride their bike through but if there was a corner of the parking lot at walmart where they wanted to set up a whole jump system and have you know, have uh, have jumps and whatever. That's something where they would have to get permission because it's not just a, a straight through. That does that make up, sense? Yes, that does make sense. But that would be up to the owner of the parking yeah. lot to go and Perfect. talk to them or approach us. Thank you. Um, would it maybe like? I guess would it be helpful then if we actually said private property that does not have public access because um, it just says pub private property in this case. Could certainly amend it however you wish. Okay, well just like for, because like I said, for, for clarity, um, when somebody reads it, they might think it means any private property regardless of, of the access. And um, yeah, thanks for the other improvements you've made to this. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate your work. Thank you.
You're Thank welcome. you, Councillor Montgomery. I go now to Councillor Langmaid. Thank you very much. It's me again. I know you've missed me. Um, jumping into section 20.3, this is the section about parking permits and specifically about uh, disabled street parking and requesting disabled street parking if you are a disabled person looking to have a spot identified outside of your house. And I just have a question here. In section A, it says that uh, the, the person requesting the installation of disabled street parking is responsible for all costs incurred by the town in completing such a request. How much does that typically cost? Off the top of my head, I'm not too sure. That goes through a different it's the sign that they pay for and the painting of blue along the curb, I believe. Is there a, a, a ball? I, I, guess, I guess what I'm, uh, this, is where I'm go, this is where I'm thinking with this, is I, I'm generally thinking that someone who has a disability who, re, who requires long-term street parking accommodation, um, you know, there, there is a chance that they might not be working full time, they might not have full time employment, full time income, they might even be on AISH, which is, you know, $1,685 a month. And I, ha I have a soft spot. They, they deserve to have a safe place just to park in front of their house. It's, you know, it's not their fault. They have a, have a disability, they, ha they have a right to have a safe place to park and access their home. So I, I would be interested to find out, uh, to get some information on just kind of what that cost is and what a resident who's looking for that service might expect to pay and, and how often it occurs in, in town. So is this something that we have, you know, one request every two years or do we have 50 of them every year? I believe I've personally only seen less than a handful. Okay. Mark, if we could maybe yes, ta take, that, uh, take that as an away just to get an email back on that one unless... Mark uh, might Mark? have a... a an, I'm sorry, I don't have a, 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 an answer for you, Councillor Langley, but I can speak with the... Um, the operations department on some costs, we can bring it back forward. Um, if, if it's the wish of council that uh, the town would do incur these costs, um, that would be just a motion from council to amend the bylaw to indicate that. So we can come back uh, when this when this brings forward with some true costs. If, if we could get some costs, that's it. it's not something that I'm recommending we remove right now, but depending on what the cost truly is, uh, maybe that's something that we could do uh, could look at as a council and decide together on that. Um, and then my final questions are around parades and, par parades and processions. Um, I see, Kevin, you still want to okay the horses uh, in town, and, and I'll live with that. I mean, <laughs> I hope you get a phone call about that one day. I hope someone asks you for a horse. Actually, I approved one today. So. Of course you did. Of course. <laughs> Was it for you, though, or...? Watch, it was for me. <laughs> I'll be going to Timmy's tomorrow on uh, Buddy, my horse. No. Um, and the, the questions I have are actually not related to horses at all. Um, so I learned in my first parade this year that we're not allowed to throw candy. Where is that rule written, and should that be in here? We can certainly put it in there. I believe... I was just made aware of it as well um, in the parade, but I believe there was some unfortunate circum incidences that happened when kids went out and grabbed the candy when it wasn't thrown far enough. So just to avoid any mishaps, um, that was the reason for not throwing candy. I, I agree. I think it's an important safety measure. I, I was just curious whether it was worth including. Mark, I can see you. Yeah, Councillor Langmaid, there is no specific law or bylaw that's, you know, what we do is we recommend and we encourage, because of these fatal tragedies that have occurred in other communities, that no members throw that, throw candy and throw other things like that mm -hmm. for the potential risk involved. Um, if council wishes to write a bylaw, um, to amend the bylaw to that we indicate that, that'd be at the whim. However, then they're also subject to this, we could have to establish some fines that could be a result. I, I, I'm not sure I'm willing to take it that far. I was. I was just curious whether it was something that should be included here or not. Um, I think it is an important safety measure. I have heard, heard of those tragic incidents, and I think it is, uh, especially when you're dealing with someone like me who throws like that, you know, safer to not throw candy on the road. But uh, I just wanted to ask about it. And the other question I had was in the same section for section 22.2, where we're talking about kind of the information that an applicant needs to provide when requesting 
permission for a parade. And I noticed that it doesn't mention anything about any sort of insurance that they might need to have to have a parade in case there is um, an incident. I can look into that, but because it's on a public road, what, what insurance are you referring to? Uh, uh, I just, I, I know that there is certain insurance that can be uh, purchased for parades. Uh, yes, Council I mean, it's something the town is, is looking into in further capacity regarding all our special events for any, not just parades, whether it's an organized concert or things like that. Uh, special event insurance is typically what it's called. Um, that's something that we are looking at within our, uh, our special events bylaw, um, that if this is supposed to, something that should be required. So um, it's something we're addressing. We're trying to address, I should say. Okay, so we're, we're looking into it. That's good. I, I just wanted to ask about that because God forbid we have an accident or an incident and the right coverage isn't in place, especially as more community groups might get involved in the planning of these types of events and they're not, uh, of events and they're not necessarily put on by the town. Um, that, that's the end of my questions. Thank you very much for your answers today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Langmaid. Councillor Montgomery. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I'd like to beat a dead horse a bit more, please. If you don't mind, uh, CAO Scoble. Yeah. yeah you're have to <laughs> yeah. Um, just with 12.4, um, so I guess, like, based on this, like, we're saying that we can dictate what happens on people's private property when it comes to, say, skateboarding or scootering or something like that. Like, um, is that right? Like, we could, we can without somebody complaining to us, like we can say, hey, you're not allowed to skateboard on that property there without even knowing what the situation is really. They don't have a letter. I mean, we can take that out. I definitely recall um, you bringing it up at the last committee of the whole meeting. I just think it's out of respect. There's a lot of money and value that go into, like even say the town, um, the sidewalk. Skateboards do a lot of damage. Uh, school property, um, we wanna try and deter them from going on to those private properties, but I'm willing to write that out. It, well, it's more of like, I'm, I'm just, like, I'm, I'm, tr I'm thinking about, like, you know, what is our ability, let's say, as a municipality that's creating laws, and, and I'm, I'm a little surprised that, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, not a, a legal expert, of course. I'm just a little surprised that we can, you know, just kind of make a blanket kind of, um, proscription of, of certain uses of people's private property um, when there isn't kind of like a, a, a safety issue, let's say. And like, I totally get your point. Like, yeah, there's, there's certain properties where obviously people don't want people, you know, using the property, et cetera. Yeah, like, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, it's, it kind of seems like we're veering into, um, being a bit too prescriptive um, because again, like, if know, I somebody, could, if some, I could, oh, could sorry, I offer yeah. something? Um, yeah. To me, 12.4 is a support to the people who own the property. It gives them the support that it's stated plainly in a bylaw that you as the property owner are allowed to protect your property or have nobody ride on it. And you are the one who would uh, have to give consent to the to the person wanting to ride so I don't I don't think this is the way I read it anyway I, I read it that it's it's not that we want to find people uh, on that property we're kind of supporting or standing behind the property owner that they can say oh no it's in the bylaw you have to have my permission to be on that property to to uh, but anyway that's just the way I read that one Go, go again, Councillor Montgomery. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I certainly, like, I, I take your point, and that's, that's like, my impression what kind of trespassing laws are for is, is so that if anybody's on your property and you don't want them on your property, regardless of what they're doing, you know, you can call the police or you can call somebody um, and, and have, that, have that taken care of with, you know, without the need for our bylaw to, to kind of say that. You know, I, like I said, I, I always look at these bylaws, you know, as if, like, it's like, what if a perfectly law-abiding person is, is you know, trying to navigate our, our community? 
and you know my my daughter for instance has a friend you know and she comes over she's got rollerblades on sometimes and by the letter of this bylaw i would have to write her a letter saying that she's got consent to you know kind of go up my driveway with her rollerblades um and and again like i just i feel like we're kind of veering too much into dictating what happens on people's private property um and i think we should leave it up to the private property owner to um to do that, um, and I'll, I'll think about this a bit more. You know, maybe it's cleaner, to, as, as Mayor Fuel says, to have you know some sort of a mechanism in there. Um, so I'll think about it some more. But thank you. Thank you, Councillor Montgomery. Councillor Wiley, uh, would you be able to give some examples of of twelve four? Like, what would that what would that look like? What is it you're trying to empower the bylaw officers to be able to do? So, sorry, through your worship, <coughs> uh, Councillor Wiley, this is basically similar to what uh, Councillor Montgomery was mentioning. Um, we do not just go and ask somebody if they have a letter of permission to ride on somebody's driveway. It's basically complaint generated. It gives that support to those residents those children are not moving off of the, their property to say, hey, we have something that we can do to enforce that. When we would show up, if we were provided a complaint, we would mention, you know, you don't have their permission to be on here. Please go find somewhere where, you know, can rollerblade on the sidewalk. You can use your skateboard at the skate park. You can find somewhere where you have permission to utilize the vehicles you have. And so in the meantime, this doesn't, I just gonna to wanna to go back to that term, private property with public access. So this does not refer to private property with public access. So can you give me some examples of private properties that have public access? Would that include like the library? Sorry, there's public access. I can look. It's clearly defined in our map section, um, what parking lots, um, pathways have public access, like Walmart, No Frills, um, Canadian Tire, anywhere where you can take your vehicle with public access, you can take your bike, your e-scooter, rollerblades. I'm not saying they can set up a skate park there, but you can still utilize. So, well, and, and it would apply too if, if, like, let's say there was a brand new Canadian tire and they had beautiful, pristine concrete and cement out in front of it. I mean, that's perfect for skateboard riders. So it would give them the backing that, you know, this is, this is private property. We do have public access, but you still have to have permission. Uh, if you're, like, it gives them kind of some backing that if guys are doing jumps in front of the place, they can say it's in the bylaw. Uh, you need permission to be doing that. But does it give them protection? I thought you said if it was a Canadian Tire or Walmart, it wouldn't. Well, I mean, it's where you can drive your car. You can't drive your car on top of, like, the cement. Okay, so can I, I, can I throw out a proposal? From. Can we go to 12.1? This is, I think, one that's written really well. And I'm wondering if, if we could um, hash it out so 12.4 kind of mimics this. So 12.1 says no person shall ride on. It gives this ex all these examples. And then it says upon a sidewalk at a rate of speed that is, and here, here's what I really like, unreasonable having regard to the nature, condition, and use of the sidewalk and the amount and kind of pedestrian traffic. Could 12.4 have something along those lines? Like no person shall use any private property and then kind of mimic this, like it disregards the nature of the property or disregards the something like that? Mark? Your Worship, and maybe this is a good an example. I'm going to try to attempt an example. So we have a vacant lot here. Um, you know, obviously it's owned by Joe Blow Citizen here. And some, some youth or whatever decide to set up a skate park 
there's some, some curbs, there's some things that are all set up there. By having 12.4 in effect, this protects that vacant lot and gives the municipal enforcement staff an opportunity to, to enforce it if the owner is not present or, or around. I think what Claudette has spoken to before though is that the officers would, would, if they're alerted to this or if they're just walking by or driving by and they see this, they would educate the individuals to say, this is a, va this is a private property. You're not allowed to be on here. Please go move into a different, different place there. If we changed it as you, I, I think as you wish there, Councillor Why, like, well, define a rate, and, you know, it's, it's more about, a, like I said, a private owner, a private lot or something like that. It's not, has the access as, as Claudette is indicated here. I, I believe Claudette, is that maybe the, the intention of it? Yes, I feel like, well, this is to support the private owner of that land and we're there to help support them by means of a portion of the bylaw that we can move forward after educating the individual to have them removed, that they do not have the landowner's permission. Yes, yeah, so but I, I could give an example that I, I think Mark's basically spelling this one out, but I'm going to mark, I'm just going to spell it out perfectly. So <laughs> right near my house, <laughs> Pat might remember it too, was this sweet dirt hill. And all the neighborhood kids during the first COVID lockdown turned this thing into like, I mean, they had irrigation ditch, ditches, they had berms. This thing was spectacular. And the private property owners and some like major serious liability issues going on here if somebody gets hurt. And so the thing had to be shut down and perhaps the bylaw officers didn't have the power to go in there and be like, you got to get off this property because the kids obviously didn't have written consent. So I can definitely see why we would want something like this in the bylaw. I just don't think 12.4 says it. I, I don't think it's clear yet. I think it leaves it too open. And I'm hoping there's a way it can be massaged to make a little more sense. Uh, if, if I might, perhaps another way to think about it is, is somebody owns that property, right? And I think we need to be very careful saying what somebody else can do on someone else's private property and what they can't. This is... Perhaps a way to frame this is this is an enforcement upon request, right? So if a property owner is okay with, with kids skateboarding and, and jumping down the rails on the steps and whatever, then, you know, w nothing's going to happen. But if they're not okay with it, and it's like Claudette's been saying, is this is, a, a, I guess, a way to support the property owners. And, and that's how I look at as enforcement upon request. Um, but to say you can do this on that person's property, but you can't do that on this person's property, I think we have to be very careful of property owners' rights as well. I, that would just be my, my thoughts on it. So I just think 12.4 needs to say that. I, I don't think it's clear. Okay. Okay, thank you, Councillor Wiley. <laughs> Councillor Langmaid. Last time you'll hear from me tonight, uh, or on this topic anyways. Uh, I think 12.4 is an, an important one to remain in. I think you can't enforce a rule unless the rule is actually written somewhere. Uh, so, you know, how am I supposed to be a grumpy, grumpy old grandma and call bylaw and go get the get these kids off my lawn if there's no rule that says that these kids can't be on my lawn? Uh, I understand that there are tr trespassing rules and things like that, but sometimes throwing the threat of a trespassing charge is, you know, it, it, I think there's use in having an intermediary step between a bylaw officer coming and educating and saying, hey, you're not, you're not supposed to be on this person's lawn or, you know, riding your bike here. Um, and it, it's an important step between that and going, okay, now we're going to charge you for trespassing because you're not supposed to be here. You know, we can, it can be a, a stepped response depending on the situation. And, and like I said, I, you can't enforce a rule that isn't written. So if we're not, if we choose to not include this, then there's, you know, you can't, you can't enforce a rule that's not there. Um, and I, I think this is especially important. You know, I'm thinking along the terms of, you know, if we had a business that, downtown that did some renovations, put in a beautiful new um, stairway up to their door with a lovely straight railing on it, and you see some kids, you know, grinding hard down the railing at night after the store is closed and they're 
cause them trouble, you know, that might have, pri you know, it's private privacy, private property uh, with public access. But um, yeah, so we, we've talked about that for a little while. Those are, those are my general thoughts on that. But I did have one, one more question in this section, um, which I've now navigated away from. Um, and that is, gone, where did it go? Oh, uh, it was about, uh, you know, the, the, it was actually about 12.1 saying, uh, you can't ride bicycles, e-bicycles, scooters, e-scooters, roller skates, inline skates, skateboard, longboard, scooters in there twice. There's a copy paste error in a bunch of sections where scooters are listed twice, but not important. Um, what I'm wondering is, is it, it specifically mentions sidewalk. What about the paths in town that are not necessarily a sidewalk in terms of a highway being along a road, but might be a pathway through a green space and, you know, kids are ripping, on, uh, ripping down the path on their e-scooter. Would that also apply there or would we need to specify that it's not just sidewalks but pathways as well? And could we include pathways if we're talking about traffic and pathways aren't part of a, you know, the highway system as described? So I think it's written in the definition section of highway. Sorry if I'm misunderstanding you, but it says a sidewalk including a boulevard adjacent to the sidewalk. And there's where it's um, publicly or privately owned and the public ordinarily are entitled or permitted to use it for the passage. Sorry, which, which definition are you Highway. Using? Highway. Yeah. I'm just going to reread that. Uh, okay. In this one, Claudette, are we trying to differentiate between a sidewalk and a paved pathway so that you could ride a bicycle on a paved pathway but not on a sidewalk in an unreasonable speed? That is correct. Thank you. Does that help, Councillor Langley? Sorry, I was, I was oh, looking for Oh, that's okay. Reference. I was just saying um, it sounds to me like there, that we'd be differentiating between a sidewalk and a paved pathway that we're only pointing out that the sidewalk um, can't be used at any rate of, of unreasonable speed. Um, that is, a, without having, with unreasonable having, not having regard to the nature condition and use of the sidewalk. So it, it, to, to me, it feels like the sidewalk is intended for walking. And so no e-bikes or scooters or that with, if, there, if the speed is unreasonable would be allowed. And again, I don't know, it just seems to me it's, it's kind of dealing with, you know, you have these e-bikes that can go pretty fast and they're pretty silent and... I, I think, sorry, just, just to clarify, I, I was, what I was hoping was that pathways and sidewalks would be treated the same. Okay, yeah, that's uh, Is I was... that, that sidewalk in this case would also include any pathway that isn't necessarily adjacent to a road. But that would then limit bicycles being on a paved pathway. Well, uh, it wouldn't limit them. It would limit them if they at were going at an un unreasonable speed. Okay. They could use them at a reasonable speed. Sure, I can definitely add that. Um, if it, that's no problem. Just, just to, it's nit, uh, maybe a bit nit, nit picky at this point. And then also in definitions, just FYI, the definition of holiday is pointless. It's never used in the document. It's, it's not needed here. Thanks for and pointing that's that out. I compared G with other municipalities as well. <laughs> Thanks. And that's okay. I did a quick find and search. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Wiley? Yeah, thank you. Just back to the infamous 12.4. I don't want to remove it. I just want to have it amend, like clarified. Um, yeah, I'd like to go to parades and processions. If I can find it. 21. 21. Okay. I can. I don't know. There it is. Um, so the definition of a parade or a procession on page 25J, the definition is 
any group of pedestrians numbering more than 20 and marching or walking on any street. And then it, it talks about vehicles. Um, I wanted to just, I wondered, does that definition, is it too big of a catch-all? Well, sorry, it does go on to say that they're likely to block, obstruct, impede, or hinder, or interfere with pedestrian or traffic. Um, but would that include something as innocuous as like a Terry Fox run? Our school sends 300 kids out to run around Kinsman Park. Like they're obstructing pedestrians. Would they need permission from the CAO? I would say no, but that's not a parade or a procession. That's a run. That's, that's a designated time run where you guys are going out. You it's like the... Tr Sorry, no, I should also note that this is on a street versus a park. So if this, if this Terry Fox run was occurring in the park... So only on... Okay, so only on marching or walking on any street. So even just... Because they'll obviously have to cross the street, traffic stop for 300... You know, like... But yeah, so for example, on Sunday, we're, there's a Terry Fox run that's occurring here in town. They have volunteers that are positioned at one of the crosswalks that they're designating to stop traffic when that happens. So the run is running through the streets. However, it's only at that one designated crosswalk. So um, we would not define it as a parade because okay. the runs are not occurring on the street. Okay, That's, that settles those for me. Okay. Um, I can't remember if we talked about this after the first reading, but um, 15 idling. I just keep reading this and rereading this. So <laughs> any person shall not cause, permit, or allow a vehicle to idle more than five minutes uh, unless it's, and basically unless it's cold outside. Well, what if you're in front of a, an educational institute? What if, you're, what if it's plus 30 and you're sitting there and you're trying to get the air conditioning on, you're picking up grandma from the medical the doctor's office, like, why do we even have the idling? I don't understand the point of this one. Or you're picking up your kid from school and maybe it's not minus 30, but it's, you know, plus three. I I'll have to get back to you on this, but I'm pretty sure this is a bigger law than a municipal bylaw. I'm pretty sure in designated areas, you're, it's like a no idle zone, like in front of medical facilities, like right there, so your exhaust is going into their entrances. And I believe that has more to do with health than this bylaw alone. But I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this. Because I just, I picture myself picking up my kid from school and now it's been seven minutes, you know, and it's hot outside. I didn't really want to turn my car off. I think it, again, this is empowers the bylaw officers if there's a, if there's a necessary complaint. I don't believe the bylaws officers will, will go around and start, start the clock when they're watching somebody this way. I think the intent is, again, about, as Claude had said, and it's about clean air. Um, you know, it's written that obviously for, for minus zero, and if council wished to uh, change the temperatures, uh, if you want to have it for air conditioning as well, that we can say it's above 20 or below 20, uh, if that's, the, I think, but I think the intention is to try to, to limit and empower our staff, uh, the staff if there's a, a vehicle uh, idling for more than uh, five or, or 30 minutes as indicated. I, yeah, I would just appreciate more information on this. And if, if it is council's will to include idling a car, then that's fine with me, but I'd like to know some more. And that's all my questions. Thank you, Claudette. You're welcome, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much, Claudette and Mark and Kevin. Thank you. For your answers and discussion. We move now to 5.2 Asset Management Briefing. Good evening, and if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself when you come to the microphone, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you on this topic. Just give me a moment to set up, please.
There you go. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> um, so hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be giving you an asset management briefing tonight. Um, I will be introducing myself. Just give me a second. I realize that's maybe two or three slides into the presentation too far. Um, but tonight, our objectives for this briefing uh, is uh, first, for awareness, what is asset management? Uh, second, an introduction into some of uh, the concepts of asset management. And finally, to inspire some conversation on the topic. So uh, a loose sort of agenda for my presentation will be an introduction, uh, then a discussion on what is asset management. Uh, I'll discuss seven questions that asset management tries to answer. Uh, then I'll have a brief conversation on the town's asset management program. And finally, uh, questions. So I guess I should introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Andre Aloha, and I am the uh, asset management officer for the town of Strathmore. I'm thrilled to be speaking to you tonight. Um, Asset management is one of the topics that I really enjoy sort of getting into, discussing with people. Uh, I've been working in municipal government for over eight years, and uh, from day one, I was literally pulled aside and said, hey, we've got a project for you. It's called asset management. And I said, oh, what's that? And it just snowballed from there. Um, so I, I come to municipal government with a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Waterloo. Uh, I've completed um, education in uh, GIS, uh, digital geography and GIS from uh, the, sorry, it used to be called Ryerson. It's now called uh, Metro Toronto University. Uh, I have uh, from the University of Alberta, um, I completed a program called the National Advanced Certificate in Local Authority Administration, level two, so it deals with uh, municipal, municipal work. I am, um, I have, I am um, a CAMP uh, professional, which is a certified asset management professional through uh, PMAC. And I'm also certified uh, through the Institute of Asset Management, which is an organization based out of uh, the UK. Uh, and also, I love talking about this stuff so much that I volunteer for an organization in Alberta called Infrastructure Asset Management Alberta. And I was the former chair of that uh, association. Um, so this uh, topic is really sort of up my alley. Uh, what is asset management? So I'm actually going to start with uh, probably a bit of a, of a strange way to, to go about it, but I'm going to tell you what it is not first. So it is not software. Asset management is not software. And I cannot tell you how often the two get confused. Often when we're talking about uh, asset management, it's referred to as a system. People think of system, they think of software, and it's not. It's not, 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 it, is, it just isn't. So if there's one thing that you do remember from today's presentation, it should be that asset management is not software. Uh, if that's the only thing, I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, we'll call it a draw and I'll, and I'll, I'll take it. Um, so, okay, what is asset management? So again, this whole presentation is going to be sort of unconventional. So we're going to start in an unconventional spot, but I think a very appropriate spot. So asset management is about community. Specifically, it's about the services that we are offering to our community. And as a municipality, there are a wide range of different services that we offer our residents. Um, so we have to try and figure out what is the most effective way of providing those services to our residents. To answer that, I mean, if you were to go through the lens of an, uh, you know, speak to an asset manager, they would, you know, point to some books like those and, and standards. Um, but really, let's let's not go into those weeds. Let's sort of take a step back, almost at the three hundred thousand foot level, and just sort of consider, uh, you know. How do we know that we're being effective? Let's sort of ask that question again. Well, we really need to understand what are our objectives? What are our goals? What are our priorities? How are you going to know if you're effective if you don't even know, you know your objectives, your goals, your priorities? 
So here in the town of Strathmore, uh, obviously, yes, we do have priorities. We do have objectives. We do have things that we hope for our community. And these things are, are obviously very important. And so through your guidance, uh, we have sort of discussed how we want this to be a community where there's affordable housing, where there's financial sustainability, uh, where uh, development is done in an intentional way, where uh, we pay attention to climate resiliency uh, and environmental stewardship. We care about ec the economic development of our community. And of course, we hope that uh, there's uh, a wellness within our, within our community. And all of these things that we have sort of set as priorities need to be reflected within the services that we're providing our residents. So in terms of how do we know if we're being effective, well, how well do we match these priorities is, is, is the first question. So now to go back to sort of the conventional spot, uh, the traditional definition of asset management is it is the coordinated activity of an organization to realize value from assets. <laughs> It's awful, isn't it? It's, it's incredibly vague. Like, what does it mean? So, okay, let's go back to that idea of uh, we've got our priorities, and so now we're, we're taking those priorities and we're coordinating an activity or a series of activities for organization. That makes sense. Now there's that second part, to realize value from assets. Well, what, what's going on there? Well, it's talking about asset. This is asset management. So let's take another step back and, and think about, well, you know, a lot of these definitions were developed by private enterprise. So let's sort of step into that. So let's just say we weren't the town of Strathmore. We were making uh, slinkies. Um, so, you know, we need to realize value from our assets. So we are coordinating an activity or a series of activities to create these things that roam downstairs alone or in pairs and make a slinkety sound. And when we're doing that, we obviously own things to make them. So we have a factory, perhaps. Uh, we would have machinery uh, to make the slinkies. And then, of course, uh, I would consider assets uh, to be the individuals that help create the processes that have the knowledge that understand the best way to, to make slinkies, perhaps. Uh, and this would all be, in effect, assets that are realizing value because we're creating these slinkies in a way that is effective. And we're taking all of these things that we own to then uh, make profit in, in this case. So a coordinated activity of an organization to realize value from assets. Um, so, from assets uh, is, is interesting. The value isn't the asset. The value is in what they're producing. And for us, again, to go back to that idea, uh, we aren't producing slinkies, obviously. We are, uh, you know, a service provider for a community. Um, so then, well, how do we then ensure that uh, these services are being provided an effective way to ask that question again? Well, it all sort of depends on a system. And there are a number of different systems out there, depending on the organization that's sort of created them. This one is maybe my favorite. It's from the Institute of Asset Management. I mean, there's different components. We won't get into it today. It's really not, that's not the point. Uh, so that's one. Uh, here's another one um, by the, I think they're called the Global Asset Management Council. But I mean, all of this is fine. Um, they, we need to have a system to ensure that we are providing value from our assets. And thankfully, you know, there's a very good system uh, in, in the municipal space. And what is that? It, it's software. No, <laughs> I got you. It's not software. OK, sorry. Uh, so the system is very simple. I mean, we don't have to have all these boxes. Um, this is our system as a, as a municipality. Um, so it is a series of documents and sort of uh, an, an assurance that these documents are all sort of in alignment. So let's go with the first one. The first one is uh, the strategic vision. So council gets to determine the organization's levels of service, maybe at a high level and they define our strategic vision and our goals and priorities. So they're setting 
the direction. You set our direction. That's the first thing. So we need to have a goal, a strategic vision. The next is a commitment to meet that goal. So in this case, the commitment, I would suggest, is the asset management policy. So administration makes a commitment to achieve your vision by using a structured methodology. And in this case, it's the methodology that's provided by uh, asset management and its principles. Uh, the third part is what is often referred to as the strategic asset management plan. And those can be thought of as the instructions. So um, what this does is this document sets the parameters. It ensures that uh, we will be able to execute on the commitment. So it sets, it sets the parameters in much like how a land use bylaw would say, we intend to develop and we intend to develop in these ways. The strategic asset management plan states that, you know, we intend to follow asset management and we intend to do it in these particular ways. And then of course, finally is uh, the asset management plan. Um, and so these are the actual plans uh, that administration would execute on to um, advance the, the vision and the goals of, of council. And that, and then, well, sorry, and then the final thing, there's that weird arrow thing, uh, which says line of sight. So basically what that means is all of these documents need to uh, be in alignment. They need to work in harmony with one another. So when we're executing on our plans, every action that we take when we have our boots on the ground are, is somehow contributing to the end goal, the strategic vision. That's how you know there's that line of sight and there's that alignment. So again, what is asset management? Well, asset management, yes, it's, it's about service provision. And of course, it's about our community. And so the things that we own, our assets, are what allow us to provide service to the community. And so again, this idea of our organization gains value from our assets uh, during the production of, of service delivery. So, um, I think I just repeated that. Yeah, the town's assets facilitate service delivery. I got ahead of myself. Uh, so that's the general idea, and that's great. But okay, so now we need to set up a system uh, that will allow us to meet council's uh, strategic goals. How do we know if the system is actually good? Um, that can be answered in many different ways. And the way that I'm going to tackle it is I'm going to say there are seven fundamental questions uh, that asset management needs to answer. Uh, so that first one is, what do you have and where is it? So obviously there's a lot of information in that. Like, What do you have? Um, so we need to coordinate activities uh, to ensure that we're gaining uh, value from our assets. Well, we need to know everything that we own so that we can coordinate those things to, to provide the service that we need to provide. Uh, is the town doing that? Yes, of course. We are keeping track of, of what we own and where. Is it complete? No, no. I mean, there's still more work that needs to be done. This is a long process. So I put up these things because these are the software titles, uh, just a few of them, that people love to confuse with what asset management actually is. It's not, it, I mean, these things help uh, with asset management, but they are not. So really what we're doing is we're creating a registry when we're asking the question, what do you have and where is it? Well, we create a, a literal document that has all of those things listed. Andre, are, are you comfortable with questions throughout or would you prefer? Absolutely, please oh, interrupt. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Langmay. Thank you very much. Just to jump in, just for, so I can kind of help create this in my head. What dollar value do you have to cross before something is considered an asset? Are we tracking every, Every pen, every paper clip, or you know, it, and I know we wouldn't. That would be a little. It seems a little ridiculous. Maybe we do. It seems ridiculous to me. But you know, what's the kind of that right. threshold there that we're thinking of? Well, the, the 
It depends on who you talk to. <laughs> well, I'm talking so, to you, so, so yeah. So <laughs> what's is, your thoughts on it? So, I mean, there is a standard uh, tangible capital asset policy. I forgot what the exact policy is called here in Strathmore, but that would be defined. So they would say anything over, I think, $5,000 is, is an asset, for example. Um, but you're right. I mean, and that's part of it. What is an asset as well? Um, when is it actually going to be... Uh, contributing to that value, right? Uh, great question, for sure. Uh, so yeah, and that's part of it. I mean, and thank you, I'll take that and we'll go to, to the next question, which is, what is it worth, right? Is, it, is another question. Uh, is it worth tracking or not? So I mean, worth is an interesting, uh, you know, dilemma in and of itself because there's different ways to look at it. So I've got a thing, how much did it cost? That's a historic cost. I have a thing, how much does it cost to replace? That's also an interesting consideration. That's a replacement cost. Um, and really, the most, um, in terms of cost, what I would like uh, council to, to think about is the idea of uh, whole life cycle cost of an asset. So for example, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So let's just say we've got a, a, you know, a lift station, for example, and there's a pump in it, and we've got to replace it. Uh, so we go to, I don't know, the pump catalog. Forgive me <laughs> for not knowing. I'd go where I go. Yeah, pumps are us, thank you. Uh, and I find two. Uh, these ones pump at the capacity that I need, and they seem, you know, um, suited for my purpose. One is 10,000, one is 5,000. Well, obviously, I should go with the finest, cheapest $5,000 red pump because. I want to save money, we're fiscally responsible, all of that. But of course, it's more than just the purchase price. Uh, so for example, uh, there are many things to consider uh, when it comes to cost. So sure, we've got the purchase price, which was what, uh, 10,000 for this blue one. Uh, and the install is 1,000, for example. So we gotta, you know, we gotta account for that. We need to account that the maintenance of this thing is approximately $500 a year. Um, the power consumption of this thing is $4,300 for repairs approximately. And of course, when the time comes that we gotta get rid of this pump because it will eventually fail, we're gonna have to pay $200, we're guessing, to, to dispose of it. Okay, so that's great. So we know those costs, so you kinda add them all up over 25 years. And then you get your final cost, your whole life cycle cost. That's you know $116,200, great. So let's go to that red cheaper one. Well, this one, $1,000 install, it's the same. $600 a year to maintain, that's about $100 more. Power is about $1,000 more, this one's $5,000 a year. Repair costs are approximately the same, we guess, $300 a year, and then to dispose of it, the same thing, $200. So you'd go, you do the math, and you say, okay, that one, over the uh, total lifespan of, of that pump, we should expect to spend $133,000 uh, approximately. So now all of a sudden, you, when you thought, looking through the Pumps R Us catalog, that you were gonna save $5,000 by buying the red pump, you're actually, over the course of the life of this thing, going to be spending 17,000 more. So when it comes to what is it worth, asset management really promotes this idea of we need to look at this thing holistically, whatever it is. Okay, uh, sorry to jump ahead, but the third question is, what is the condition and expected remaining service life? of our assets. So that's, I mean, that's incredibly important. First, we need to know where they are. Sure, absolutely, what they cost. And then what condition are they, on, are they in? So for example, this was uh, uh, a road asset management plan. It comes um, produced in, in 2019. And yeah, so they did conditions for all of our roads. So that's, you know, at that point in time, the conditions that, uh, that were, um, given, provided to us. So, okay, that's great. And now knowing that, of course, we can then take that condition information, and, and this is a, an example out of Carroll County, 
um, where, okay, if you do worse first, which is the one on the, on the left, you'll see that that expenditure over time just increases and increases and increases. Uh, whereas now, if you know the condition and you combine it with some optimized uh, capital replacement schedules, you potentially can save you know, a lot of money. But that doesn't happen if you don't know what condition things are in. So understanding condition is incredibly important as well. Um, the fourth question, what is the level of service expectation and what needs to be done? So level of service is interesting. So we, we obviously know that we provide a whole bunch of, of services to our community. So I, I go to an example that isn't mine. Um, it's from a colleague of mine, uh, Jamie Rosma Stinson. She works uh, for the uh, city of Calgary. And, she, and just sort of in conversation, because like I said, I like to talk about this stuff, we were talking about parks. Uh, and in particular, you know, a park in Calgary. And they went to the uh, community. It was a aging population. And they said, you know, do you like your park? I said, we love it. And they said, yeah, we, we, uh, we do a lot of maintenance on it and, and we make sure that it's top notch for you. Uh, so we cut the grass every week. And in consultation with the community, the community said, yeah, we don't, we don't really care <laughs> that you, you know, it'd be fine if you did it once a, once a month, actually. Yeah, we'd, be, we'd all be okay with that. And uh, Jamie kind of heard that and went, oh my gosh, we are gonna save a lot of money because we're going to set a level of service that is appropriate for this community. And that's the one thing that when we think of level of service, often people think more, 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 faster, you know, all this. But really when, we want, when we're talking about level of service, we wanna talk about appropriate. What is, appro what is the good fit? And level of service gets into a lot of detail. Um, there's different ways of thinking of level of service. So this is, uh, uh, just to go through it, I, I hesitate because I'm like, should I go into it? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to hold you hostage. Um, so, yeah, when we're thinking of level of service, well, there's sort of uh, different ways, uh, different perspectives on it. So there's the technical levels of service. So to cut this grass, what do we need? We need mowers, we need people, we need whippersnippers. That's sort of a technical level of service. Then you've got that customer level of service, which is probably the most important. So that's what our residents see when it comes to the level of service. So for them, it's the frequency of work. For them, it's once a month, once every other week, once every other week something like that. That's the customer level of service, and that always needs to be considered very carefully. Then finally is the service outcome, or sorry, the um, what are our objectives for uh, our service level? Or Excuse the me, Andre, outcomes. we have a question from Councillor Mitzner. Yes. Okay, so just previous to what we're talking about now, has this position existed with the town of Strathmore for a long time, or are you in a new position? I'm a new position. So I, I began on April 15th. Okay, my next question is, because we've asked over a year ago now, we're looking as council for what you're referring to as a registry. Like, what are our assets? We don't know. Yes. So yeah. if we could see, like, I mean, infrastructure, we've been told is an asset. But we also know what's above the ground. So then we can do research and we can look at these things that you're bringing to our attention, but we need to see the whole picture. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what are our objectives when it comes to our levels of service? And then finally, the corporate level of service. So how does it speak to our goals, our vision, level of service? Uh, the fifth question is, when do you need to do it? So again, for example, we have the uh, road asset management plan, which speaks to our condition. And part of that road asset measurement plan also spoke to when we need to do it. So this is a proposed long-term asphalt plan. While you're talking about that, uh, the road plan and the infrastructure below, this was one of the things that I found interesting when we started in, in my first term on council and second as well. 
uh, we started to really work at re uh, repairing roads, but the infrastructure, the pipes below. And one of the things I hadn't considered was the loss of water on a daily basis due to damaged pipes, uh, not just from a conservation point of view regarding that asset, but as far as the cost of the water from Calgary. And I hadn't considered that kind of thing. So uh, considering your assets and improving upon them gives you benefits that you don't necessarily see right away. And, and obviously this area of Alberta has you know, got a real, we have to be concerned about water usage and, and uh, you know, having things come from the Bow River and Bow Glacier. Uh, it was really an eye-opener for me, so I, I really appreciate this example you've been talking about, too. Thank you. Yeah, and likewise, I mean, you know the condition of those pipes. Then you know sort of the risks that you are uh, holding if, if you continue with, with them at that condition. And again, it goes back to that idea of uh, optimized replacement plans or, or even that idea of, uh, you know, adding when you need to do things, sometimes small but timely renewal investments will save you money over time. Um, this uh, question is, is very uh, involved, so I am admittedly gonna breeze over the risk session, but uh, how much will it cost and what is the acceptable level of risk? So, I mean, just very quickly, risk, uh, we all sort of know is, is a, a function of likelihood and consequence. So you go through that, the example that you give, for example, um, you know, a pipe is about to burst, or maybe we're aware that uh, it's a smaller pipe, as an example, um, and it doesn't affect too many uh, residents because it's in a isolated area of town. Well, yeah, is, what's the likelihood? Well, maybe the likelihood is really, really high, but the consequence, because it only affects one or two people, households, what have you, is, is lower. So you need to sort of straddle yourself within, within these, uh, not really quadrants, but uh, sort of uh, suggested um, activities. So uh, understanding your risk is important and will affect the strategies that you take on. And then finally, how do you ensure long-term affordability? Well, uh, the best way is to ensure that you have a good system. Because the community is worth it at the end of the day, and that's what this is all about. Um, so that is what is asset management very, very quickly, and I, I do appreciate that I've been uh, sort of skirting over some things and not, not uh, going into the weeds on purpose. But that is, if you were to understand asset management, it's about our community, it's about service delivery, it's about how we're managing our assets to ensure that service delivery. So I guess the next question then would be, you know, what, where are we right now and what are we doing? And, and what, how, what is our approach as, as a community uh, for our asset management program? So uh, what we've decided to do uh, is do a assessment. Uh, so we did the assessment internally. We used a tool uh, that was created by FCM, which is the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And they go through and you evaluate the organization based on these five different competency areas. Then once you've gone through that evaluation, there are a number of activities, uh, projects perhaps, that uh, you are then, you should then sort of take on to progress. So I guess what needs to be understood is that um, the town is in its infancy with its asset management program. There is a lot of work. Um, and the projects uh, that we're working on will not get us to the end of asset management. There is, there's never an end. Um, and in terms of FCM and, and its grading, we are at sort of a one out of five. That's not bad. I mean, in terms of where we sit across the board with respect to other municipalities, we are right there. We're sort of uh, 
right in the middle, in the heart of how all municipalities are right now with their asset management programs. Um, and so we created a uh, roadmap of activities that we will be uh, taking on uh, for the next two to three years. And again, these activities aren't going to get us to that five out of five. These activities will get us to two out of five. But it's a slow, iterative process, and um, it is something that uh, I'm looking forward to taking on. Uh, there's a lot of support within uh, senior leadership uh, to get these things done. And so just to go through some of these things, uh, we need to discuss at some point in the future an asset management policy. Uh, we need to define a strategy for the asset management program. Uh, we need to sort of establish um, performance measures for our levels of service. We need to establish our, our, our levels of service. What are, what are the services that we provide? That needs to be understood. Um, we need to include you more in these conversations of asset management. Uh, that's also on there. Um, so in April, infrastructure asset management in conjunction with Alberta municipalities and rural, the rural municipalities of Alberta are putting on uh, a training course for elected officials and uh, senior leaders. So that's something that I I've, I've, uh, would want you to consider. Um, we're also uh, going to be, well, let's see here. So we, we've already sort of outlined our asset management team. Uh, we've got an uh, asset management steering committee now at the town. Uh, we've outlined our terms of reference. We have an understanding of, of how we are making these decisions internally. Um, we need to eventually start creating asset management plans. Um, and all of this will take uh, up to three years. Um, if we're going to create plans, we need to have the information. Like you said, we need to have that asset registry first. And, and so we have to build all of these pieces. It's a system, it's a culture change. It's, it's something that we are um, ta tackling and uh, we're in it you know, for the long haul. This is now how I hope the town will conduct its business. So any further questions? Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Langmaid. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Hello, fellow nerd. <laughs> I'm excited for this. I love asset management. And I, right. say, I say that word with, with, with a lot of uh, respect. Uh, sure, sure. Fellow, yeah, yeah. Fellow well, no, nerds. you found me out. That's My fine. nerd. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, have, I have a few questions here that I'm just going to maybe run through and get your ideas on, just things that I wrote down while you were speaking. Uh, one of them is, can you talk a little bit about how asset management relates to procurement? And how those two need to hold, uh, kind of, yeah, need to hold hand, uh, need to hold hands together because, yeah, sure. You talk about it. Sure. <laughs> so yeah, I think you know, obviously, when we're talking about capital procurement, there is, there's a process that we should follow, and I'm slowly getting back to that slide. Um, oh man, I talked a lot, didn't I? I apologize. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, never. <laughs> hey, 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 enough. Um, so, I mean, if we're looking at um, procurement, this is an interesting model. So uh, this, would, this one would suggest that we need to do a demand analysis, needs uh, a solution, uh, understand our needs, uh, so community needs, if we're going to be taking on a large capital project. Um, Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm steering us in the wrong direction by trying to answer this too technically, but does it have a place uh, in procurement? Yes, absolutely. So at a minimum, it's that idea of um, whole life cycle cost. Let's just say that to keep it simple. So if we're going to uh, be procuring a, a large capital um, asset, we need to ensure that we understand the costs associated with it. Part of it is, you know, understanding if it's appropriate for the community, yes, of course, but then also uh, the majority of costs 
in the lifespan of any asset is in the operations and maintenance, like 80%. Mm -hmm. So if we don't really understand the costs of running a thing or, you know, a, let's say a, a field house, whatever that is, uh, you know, we, we aren't maximizing our, our, our money. And so, yes, absolutely, it should be a part of it. Okay, thank you. Um, so speaking of kind of on the same thread of, you know, a whole life cycle analysis, how do you factor in things like inflation and technological change into a life cycle analysis for costing, you know, especially these days when you might be procuring something with the intention of operating it for 20 to 25 years, but a technological change can quickly make it irrelevant? Sure. Um, I guess I'll answer that with, you know, one of my favorite quotes about any models. Like, really, we're just trying to make uh, decisions that are well-informed, defensible, using models, perhaps. But the problem with models is all models are wrong and some models are useful. And so, uh, you know, you can only make decisions with the information that you have. And yeah, sometimes you won't foresee the, the technological advancements that occur. It's part of life, I guess. So it's just a risk that you have to kind of include within the evaluation, got it. And then um, my final question that I have written down here it's more around the inclusion of ecological assets in an asset management strategy. So yeah. not just the pipes under the ground, the fire hydrants, the benches, you know, the, the, the physical items, but how, how can you value something like the number of trees that we have in our community? You know, how can you value, you know, what value can you put on it on a tree? And if the community lost that tree in the replacement of that tree, how can you value green space? Those types of assets that we have that are maybe a little less tangible. Sure, I love that question. I think it is something that uh, people are struggling with right now. There is a movement that's called the Municipal uh, Natural Asset Institute. Yeah. Or something like that. Thank you. Um, and they are really, yeah, and they're really doing a great work in that space of natural assets and creating. So the idea of an asset registry. Well, yeah, okay, we know all of the roads, we know all of the pipes, but should we not also include things like wetlands or trees? Yeah. 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 So uh, I've attended uh, conferences on the topic. And that's a conversation I've had with uh, our senior leaders. And it's something that I think is, is valid and, and worth sort of looking into. Uh, the, the more contentious uh, space of that conversation is, I suppose, uh, how, do you, um, how do you value them in terms of, do you actually put them on the books or do you not? Uh, because if you do one action or the other, they obviously have different consequences. But yes, uh, asset management can speak to natural assets, you know, for, for sustainability purposes, etc. And uh, you, I mean, you have a watershed, for example, uh, that watershed uh, sort of handles so many, you know, cubic meters of, of water. Um, you could, I guess, in theory, say if we were to engineer a like. Uh, system that would cost X amount. So then you've then you've almost got a value, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So something yeah, to think about. I, I guess where my thoughts were for that were going. You know, I guess the, I'll use trees as the example here. You know, for every tree that you have in the community, there's an associated uh, cost for maintaining that tree, making sure that it's safe and healthy and looks nice and it's going to survive. And then there's a cost for replacing that tree and how you know. You, you could even get down to a granular level on how much are we spending per species of tree <laughs> if you really wanted to. Uh, you know, you could do some neat things. So yeah, thank you, thank you for speaking on that. Uh, asset management is, is really interesting to me and I also like how you spoke about smaller investments over time can actually save you money rather than just one large rehab. You know, it, it makes me think of uh, back in July, I had a faucet in my house for a couple months, I knew that faucet was acting a little weird, but I didn't do anything about it because I wanted something else. 
and that faucet failed. And now I get new floors and new drywall and new, new insulation. <laughs> and of course, you know, once you get the contractors in, you might as well do the fireplace and the rest of the floors. So it's that idea of had I, had I not been so cheap and spent $250 on a new faucet when I, when I thought, oh, this faucet is acting a little funny, I could have saved myself a whole lot of money, even though a $200 faucet might seem, well, the one I have, it's working. Well, it's that idea of, well, it's time. So I think asset management has a really important role in the future of the community and how we, especially how we as a council conduct planning. And I'm, I'm excited for the work that you're doing and to see, to see the outcome of it. And uh, welcome to the team as of, as of April. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Langmaid. Councillor Montgomery, followed by Deputy Mayor Peterson. Thank you. Um, first of all, like great presentation. That was uh, one of the best presentations that I've, I've been uh, been privy to in this council. Um, just following up on, uh, well, first of all, and I just want to say I'm really excited to see what you're going to do. And, and, you know, it's great to see, you know, kudos to you, Kevin. It's great to see the town moving in this direction. And, uh, you know, this is, a, it's a big investment, but I think it's, it's completely worthwhile and it's going to pay off. Um, one question I have just has to do with like intangible value, let's say. Um, so, you know, if you're getting non-monetary value from an asset, is that accounted for in asset management? Like when I, when I, like, you know, if you take, say something like a park, but you know, like where we're not getting actual money, you know, out of the park necessarily, but people are enjoying the use of something. Is that accounted for in asset management? Sure, I guess in the sense that uh, we'd be considering that through level of service. So this is, you know, the enjoyment of park of a park is something that we want our residents to, to uh, participate in, and so we would set the levels of, of what that looks like. You know, do we have benches there? Do we have three benches there? Do we have flowers there? I mean, all of those things have a cost, and all of those things would be planned for through an asset management plan. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I, like I like I said, I, I really appreciate like things that are data driven and evidence based, and and this is you know obviously what you're all about. And so, like I said, thank you very much, and uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what you're going to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Montgomery, Deputy Mayor Peterson. Thank you. I I'm uh, glad you're here. And uh, if if I had my way, we would have hired an urban anthropologist, but but we'll take an asset manager. And uh, <laughs> your your, uh, your background is uh, impressive. And, and I, in, in staying out of your operation side, my, my question is related to that whole concept of property versus asset. If you can own it versus whether you can put value on it. Right. And so for me, I just want to say that's really, really important because I understand that asset management is usually related to fiscal management, property value, and what you can put as my my conservative friend at the end said, a dollar value on. <laughs> and so I think that there are also assets that we can't, that are worth something, that we don't necessarily put a value on. And I think that those things are the things that we, that, that also in terms of the priorities that council set in their strategic direction, that drive the heart and soul of community that make the journey worthwhile. And so I believe that those things too are uh, equitable and measurable. But I would like to hear your thoughts on how you've incorporated them into your strategy. All right, so I guess, and by the way, just to sort of state it, I love that idea. I mean, that's how I like to look at this issue as well. <laughs> it's, it's really, we really need to consider uh, what is valuable for the community, not, you know, necessarily, it, is it tangible? I mean, those things are obviously important, but uh, at the end of the day, it's what is bringing value to our community. Um, and there are things that, uh, for example, programs that we've got, I consider those incredibly valuable. But you would never say this program is an asset necessarily. You wouldn't put it on the books like that. Um, you wouldn't have it on an accountant ledger to say this, you know. But I think I think that's 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 there. So 
the issue that we've, we've got is, is an issue of capacity. And do I want to get there? Yes. Um, and I don't want to kill enthusiasm, but I do want to remain pragmatic about the asset management program. So the likely the first things that we will look at are those more traditional things, and then we'll expand. And I do hope that we do expand uh, to take account for um, natural assets. I mean, these are these are my personal opinions, and I'm sorry I haven't sort of maybe necessarily no. spoken to I others. I think that's really them. important. Yeah. I think I think my my concern when you look at council's priorities, which you touched on in this presentation, those priorities are heavily. Um, entrenched in values and so representing the values of community as a as a council with very diverse ideas and and context you know we we come out of this idea I think as you said of creating value you know within the objectives and and so I I think that if we don't think about if, if we don't think about asset management from a holistic perspective in terms of not just what we can own, but also that which has value. And so whether or not you can quantify it absolutely in the same way you would quantify uh, the desk that we sit behind, you can still measure it and you can still quantify it. And so losing that, because to me, when I look at our priorities, that is what drives this process, at least from the governance perspective, mm -hmm. sitting behind here. So you've told us about all the things that you've done, and my hope is that that, that has come to be through the priorities that, that you mentioned in this presentation. Because if it doesn't, that you know, there is a huge loss in terms of that which you um, that you assign worth to but haven't quantified. And so quantifying that to me is is important. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think, no, and I hear your point. I, I feel like what you're saying is we need to ensure that uh, the actions that we're taking are going to meet our priorities, our objectives, and bring value to our community. And that's why the asset management system... It lends itself. Is, it, it, it does. It, it does. Yeah. And so that's where that line of sight is so important. So the instructions need to uh, result in in progress on the strategic vision, just like the asset management plan needs to result in progress to the strategic vision. This system is nothing without that line of sight. And actually that that line of sight is probably the most that, that's important what I thing. About. Well, and I think that yeah. you said it. You said that you know creating value within the owner's objective. Like our community, they own this, not us, but our community owns this. So that idea of creating value, and value means more than just the quantifiable concrete pieces. But yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Andre, when you're tracking the assets, and I really like the example of the pipes from Pipes or Us, but when you're looking at the, the cost of the item and then the life cycle, uh, Councillor Lang made mention, Councillor Lang made mention the, the concept of inflation as far as replacing it through the life cycle. How do you track an asset when the opposite occurs, and I'll give you an example. We had a price quote on Lakeside Boulevard here to, to redo it with all the infrastructure, and the price came in high and we weren't comfortable with it. So we put it on hold. The following year, there was a real downturn in the economy, and we were able to get it and another road done for the quoted price of the one Lakeside. So when you look at that asset, Lakeside Boulevard, how do you then track it and accommodate for the concept that you got it basically in a way for half the price and you got two roads done for the original quoted price? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And I think um, this process is iterative. And I think that's uh, you know key in understanding. And I can't find the, the slide that I want naturally. Um, but it's this idea that you're always going back. So yes, we create an asset management plan this year. But what we need to do is we need to make a commitment to say what, periodically, whatever that is, whatever is deemed appropriate, once every three years, once every other year, once a year, uh, we will make a plan and adjust based on new information. Uh, so, yeah, 
what did I do here? So the one that I'm looking for is, is this. Uh, <clears throat> right here. So you can see that, yeah? Um, so it's this idea of whenever you get um, new knowledge, it has to go into your decision making. And you're doing this, oh, you know, it's, like I said, it's iterative and it needs to be periodic. So when we do this, the asset management program is not static. An asset management plan is not something that we can just create and put on the shelf. It's something that we need to incorporate into our decision making. And because we're incorporating it into our decision making, it needs to be looked at frequently. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Montgomery. Thank you. Um, so with the example of the pumps, um, how, like, you know, you can obviously predict the amount of power that's probably going to get used um, more easily than, say, something like maintenance. So how would you, you know, if you have a $5,000 and a $10,000 pump, um, how would you predict, you know, like the difference in, in, say, maintenance that you would expect over the life term? Sure. So I'm not a pump expert, yeah. but uh, typically there, there would be some sort of tech sheet and it would have, it would provide specs like that. So, um, I mean, and that's the other thing too, as an asset management officer, I'm not an, I'm not an expert in, in you know, all of these different functions. Uh, what I'm here to do is I'm here to facilitate, to set up the system to ensure that the system is set up properly. But to, your, to, your, to answer your question, um, you know, someone who is more well-versed in, in that kind of uh, world of pumps, they would probably go to a tech sheet and, and those things would mm. probably be listed. And they'd have their methods to accurately cost. So, uh, so if I might, this is, this is where my plant days come in. So to get back to the mayor's comments initially here, asset management isn't the only tool. It's a powerful tool, but there's other tools we would look at. So in terms of procurement, you know, you would have the work output by the, the asset management plan, but then, you know, if you think that you need to defer it for a year, your plan would be able to tell you, is there still a net benefit to deferring it a year to get better construction pricing, right? So once this is in place, it's, there's, it, it's very, it's a tool to help make decisions, but it's not the only consideration in making a decision. Now, once the asset management program is done and in place, getting into the pump question, you would have um, a maintenance program established, right? And, and you would have predictive maintenance, you would have preventive maintenance, and you'd have regular maintenance. So you can take this information from that and then you start drilling down and having more detailed uh, operations and maintenance plans based on what the asset management program tells you. You know, in, in addition, if you use the pumps, um, you know, there's the $5,000 pump and there's the $10,000 pump, but sometimes you also say, we're going to have a pump for, we're going to make a decision that we're going to run that pump for 15 years or we're going to run it for 20 years. And, you know, the conventional wisdom is we'll get more value for running it for the 20 years, but your asset management program complemented by your predictive and preventive maintenance may actually, again, say, actually, it's better if we only use it for 15 years. It's cheaper in that life cycle. So, you know, as, as was mentioned at the beginning, this is just the beginning and, and asset management will never end. And in fact, over time, it will, the organization will drill down further within their functions and, and their equipment and look at their maintenance plans and their operations plans using the information that comes from asset management. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Andre. That's fantastic, you guys. Thank you, Andre, for your presentation and uh, welcome to the, to the staff. Uh, I'm, I'm really impressed with the fact that we're getting far more involved in analyzing what we have, uh, the life cycle. It's going to be far more uh, beneficial to council to know a lot more and to, as you said in your presentation, to become a little more involved too. Less yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. We move now, but I can't read till I put these on. 5.3 Council Boards and Committees Bylaw Review. Jonathan.
Thank you, Worshiping Council. Uh, before you is a draft of the Boards and Committee's bylaw. This bylaw was previously presented to Council for review in May. We're bringing this bylaw back to you to, for you to provide more feedback on the bylaw and potential terms of references. If you are happy with the bylaw and the terms of references today, then we'll bring this back on October 5th uh, for first, second, and third reading. And then uh, following that meeting, we will start advertising vacancies for uh, council's appointment on the October 26th organizational meeting. So some of the discussion points that occurred during the main meeting were uh, the issues around live streaming and then how can we best leverage those task forces to move council's strategic priorities forward. Uh, the other thing I know we wanted to discuss today, I understand last week a motion was made to discuss boards and committees reports and how we want them to go forward. So. Um, if council's in agreement, we can, at the end of this presentation, have that conversation. So as we discussed previously, I'll just do a brief overview of the bylaw. It's really separated into three different parts. Uh, we have the boards and committees framework, we have committee procedures, and then we have a code of conduct for members. So with our new boards and committees framework, we're recommending that we want to leverage those task forces and have fewer standing committees. Um, this is actually one of those things that many communities are starting to do, have fewer standing committees and have more task forces. The reason being is that they can be very administratively heavy, take up a lot of resources to have those standing committees. So we want to make sure that going forward that those task forces are tied to council strategic priorities and have defined uh, timelines and, and purposes as well. So since we already went through the bylaw once and I know it's getting a little late, I just thought I'd open the floor if council has any questions about the bylaw specifically. I have the bylaw here. We can kind of flip to it and, and discuss whatever sections you have questions about. Thank you, Jonathan. Councillor Langmaid. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I have just a few comments on this one tonight. Uh, my first kind of question is in 8.7 under membership, and that says, each committee shall have only one member of a family serving on it at one time to ensure that there is a diverse range of views and perspectives. I think that's a great idea. We don't need a whole family on a board, but could we please define family? Oh, good idea, yeah. You know, is it your wife, or is it your cousin, or, I mean, this is a small town, like, you could get your third <laughs> cousin on a committee, and, yeah. well, I mean, technically, in some towns, that might be your wife. Um, <laughs> not ours um, I, so that was my first question uh, my second question uh, on terms of appointment um, just to, maybe to have some discussion or thought around uh, competency based requirements for uh, committee members and, and whether we kind of want to consider that and, and define what well, you know, what kind of core competencies we'd be looking for. I, I see in the terms of reference, we, uh, we start to do that a little bit, um, but I'm wondering if, if there might be value in taking that a little bit further, especially uh, uh, for things like the assessment board and things like that. Uh, sorry, so what uh, section is that? Uh, it, it's just section nine. Section nine. It's just in general, a oh, general okay. comment is just kind of, We've touched in here on competency-based requirements, but could we maybe, is, the, is there value in looking at it further? Um, what is council's thoughts on us maybe making that, tying that in more with the terms of references to make them specific to each board and committee, or would you want them to be kind of have a general list of, of competencies? I, I think there's even an opportunity to maybe include it in more of a general term, just saying that, that you know, uh, core competencies will be considered uh, for appointments to the, to roles. Something oh, okay. just something general, saying that you know, uh, give us some some wiggle room. We might not always have. Uh, you know, we might have a variety of volunteers that that come to us, and and it might not always be someone that in our mind is, you know, the perfect person. So we have some flexibility is needed, but maybe a reference to it. Um, just a thought there. So, so and sorry, just to interrupt. So we could put something, are you thinking like something like uh, appointments will be based, we'll set out priorities for each board and committee and 
and kind of as a, as a decision-making matrix almost when we absolutely we and, and it will change over time too because yeah. as the as as the makeup of your committee changes you know the competency you'll need to you, you sure. might want to try and bring into the into the uh, committee might be different sure. um, and then um, um, just a couple so those were my two uh, biggest ones uh, a couple of small ones under section 13 electronic communications a committee may be conducted by means of electronic or other communications is that supposed to be a committee meeting may be conducted or can we have a totally online committee committee meeting okay yeah. um, in section 14.2 below that I see that agendas must be sent to the town's legislative services division no later than two days prior to a business or prior to a meeting being held is that two calendar days or two business days if you're having a meeting on Monday do you want it to come in Friday night I mean, I'd be fine with that I check my emails then but uh, <laughs> we will make it two business days that's a good, good comment too. just a suggestion to make sure that things aren't yeah. sliding you know because that'll happen and then um, my last comments are on eligibility of members to be appointed to, to committees this is kind of a callback to a conversation that we've had as a council before about whether we want uh, whether we want only residents on committees or whether we can invite people from outside of town to join committees. Now I know in the library board, the decision was we want local. We don't want to appoint anyone to our library board who doesn't live in town. Mm -hmm. And I notice in this document, we say that they must be residents or business owners of the town. So we could have, uh, you know, non-residents, yeah. granted business owners, but non-residents coming in uh, at, onto committees. And I, I was just curious maybe on, uh, you know, maybe there's a purpose to why the two are different or maybe is, what, yeah. what's the thoughts there? So th uh, through your worship, uh, I think the thought there is in the event that we were to ever have an economic development committee or something along those lines, a, a downtown revitalization committee, something like that, we can open it up to anyone who's opening, who owns a business in that area. So we just want to have some flexibility in that case. In the terms of references, we would also spell that out a little bit clearer too. So for the most part, I think we do want to appoint residents and if there's ever an event that we wanted to have a regional committee, we would probably go, probably have a different bylaw for those types of committees. Okay, and then the final question I have uh, is, I noticed that a council member appointed to a committee, uh, to a committee uh, cannot vote, which is, the, uh, I mean, that that's a discussion to be had maybe, but that, not the question I have. The question I have is, it says you can't vote, but you can bring forward a motion. So you can bring forward a motion, but you can't vote on it? Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. I, I would, this would be a discussion I think would be between council right now. Um, it goes, I think there's arguments on both sides. So um, I'd be really curious to see what council's perspective is on those. I would sections. too, if anyone has some thoughts they'd like to share. Does anyone have any comments right now while it's up, uh, while, we're, while we've just discussed it as far as councilors voting on committee boards? Councilor Montgomery? Um, yeah, having sat on like a few council committees, uh, and so like I, I was, I guess, around when the change went from being a voting member to a non-voting, um, I, can, I can see why you wouldn't want council voting necessarily. Making a motion, I think, is probably not problematic because, you know, it's up to the committee to, you know, vote it down or up. Um, so I think it's cleaner to not have council voting, and I think it's kind of just like a, like a technical thing whether they can put forward a motion or not. So I don't, I don't personally see a problem with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on that part? Then are you okay? I, 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 I am concluded. That was my entire list. Thank you very much okay. for everyone's patience. Thank you. And I do have Councilor Montgomery followed by Deputy Mayor Peterson. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, so I have a question <coughs> about Schedule D, uh, where it says Multiculturalism Committee. Yeah. Is that like a committee that we're forming? So um, later on, I was going to get to the terms of references, and this is a question that came up in the past, so I just wanted to present it to council. Is this something that you guys would like to enact on October 5th? The issue with this, this kind of committee, too, is, uh, is probably what, uh, what would be the outcomes that council would want with this committee? 
there's some questions around it. So this would be just a discussion point for council for tonight, I think. Yeah, and, and if I can elucidate. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I thought I'd try that one. Um, I yes, I, I brought forward the, the concept of multiculturalism committee. I'm, I'm interested in the discussion as far as if that's the way we want to proceed or keep proceeding the way we have been. Uh, there are other options that we can consider as a town. Uh, so that I'm glad you have the terms of reference. It makes it much cleaner. So comments on, did you want comments on multiculturalism committee as a potential concept? Can um, we discuss it after? Or? Sure. Jonathan said we finished yeah, this. Yeah, sure. We Let's finish this okay. then. Okay, well, I'll just, I'll just point out, so uh, you probably just were copy and pasting. It just says yeah. uh, under multiculturalism, it says the Community Improvement Program Committee, for example. Yeah. Sorry, my apologies. Yeah. No, that's okay. Deputy Mayor Peterson. I was just going to go back to uh, Councillor Langmaid's comments about competency review. Councillor Wagner and I have been through a fairly exhaustive uh, exercise in, in the provincial, um, provincially upcoming, provincially mandated uh, competency-based processes for boards with municipal appointments. And, uh, and it, was, it is a surprisingly uh, elucidating process. It was it was great. You know, it was it was really uh, useful. And I think that for the sake of of of, of uh, operations, it would be a really good tool to utilize when you're just uh, defining uh, the terms of reference in terms of of uh, competency based. I think it would be a really good tool to use. And the other thing that I was looking at was um, on page one forty two. Uh, section 21, um, and, and that is with regards to what, what was also been earlier referenced uh, regarding uh, representing the town of Strathmore. And, and while I really agree with this, and I think that it's, that it's key, I also see opportunity for those um, committees versus task force, uh, um, standing committees, ad hoc committees, uh, all of those things being um, having allowances to bring in um, people that would be useful to the process. So sp think especially when we're dealing with our, our counterparts, you know, and I, I think in terms of the work that Councillor Wagner and I do with the Lodge. And so the Lodge has a much broader context than just the town. And one of the things that we often seek uh, support in for those really important uh, issues to, to our town is um, uh, input from the broadest possible perspective. So this is something where people who will use this lodge in the immediate future and in, in decades to come are, many of them are not residents of this community, but they are all residents of our neighboring communities are very likely. And so being able to have focus groups or, or as you say, committees and task force, and being able to involve, to uh, fold that into our IDP or IEF, whatever we, ICFs, whatever we call them, you know, is a sort of a low hanging fruit that we can really in, involve ourselves uh, with those other communities by getting those experts in community to bring information back to something like, like the lodge from a town perspective. So I don't know how that would look. I don't know if it, if it takes what you described as a separate bylaw where, where we talk about um, additional um, orders or processes or, or how that looks, but I, I do see potential and possibility for it. And, and uh, just like for the library, you know, thinking about you know, how they, how they uh, might cater to programs outside of the community itself and how that would look you know, in an ad hoc committee for specific reasons, particularly related to fundraising, for instance. So anyway, just, just thinking about it out loud, uh, Your Worship. And thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so through Your Worship, would Council would then be agreeable if we were to change some of the terms for appointment to say um, a resident of Strathmore, business owner, or unless otherwise specified in the terms of reference or something like that, just to give us a little bit more leeway? Yeah. That, yeah. Okay. that sounds good. Uh, Councillor Wiley. Thank you. I just have one question about this and then some very general questions that I think we all want to discuss. So mine is 29.1 required training. 
Committee members must attend a training that is legislatively required, failure to do so, da 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 da, da. I'm just wondering whose responsibility is it to communicate to the legislatively required training? Is it the town's responsibility? Is it the chair of the committee? And does there need to be a record of this communication if the member risks losing, uh, being deemed to have resigned if they don't, if they yeah. fail to do it? Yeah, uh, thank you. So, so through your worship, it would be our department that would be the one that would communicate that with the appointee. So a good example would be the ARB or SDAB. There's legislative requirements for uh, clerks and for members to get the specific training so they can sit on appeals. Um, so we, we always are on the lookout for training when it's put on by the government or by different law firms. And then we're communicating with those members too. We have a list, a spreadsheet of, of who was trained, when they were trained, and when they're going to be need, to undergo more training, essentially. So I think the training lasts for three years. And does there need to be a record of when you've told them that, hey, you got to get to this in the next three months? Yeah, we keep those emails. It's all in okay. our, our records management software. Perfect. And we, uh, we keep their uh, application for the training, all that stuff. So it is something that we're, um, to be completely honest, we could do a better job of, I think, going forward. But we do keep track of, of who's been contacted for training, when they need to undergo training, and um, let them know also when, when, they, when their training is going to be, need to be redone, essentially. Thank you. Thank you. My other questions are as much for council as they are for administration. They're just generally about the remaining standing committees and then, of course, the multicultural one. Are we ready to transition to that? I think so. I, I have a similar line, um, and maybe mine will tie into yours, Jonathan. I'm comfortable with what you have here as far as your, your bylaw. My question is, and I've always been confused, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming maybe new councillors are confused too. Over the past several years, we've streamlined and, and done away with some committees, but we still have some committees, and it's never been fully explained to me uh, where in this committees like the Chamber of Commerce fit in, Community Futures, like Handy Bus, why is it not listed here as one of our those, ones? Those are external committees that we have agreements with those nonprofits. So okay. then with those agreements, we can appoint members to their boards. Those so what is the difference of... between the library board and the Handy Bus board as far as its makeup and... We, we take ownership of those boards, essentially. The library board's not the cleanest example because under their act, they're a corporation on their own. But So the difference between, a, say, SDAB and uh, the handy bus is that we have authority and we have a requirement under legislation to set out the terms of references, uh, the terms for appointment, and those types of things with the handy bus because we have an agreement in place, an MOU, I believe, with that one. We, uh, and with that MOU, we asked for a membership to be on that board. So there's nothing said in policy or bylaw that we have to be on the Handy Bus Board, the Chamber of Commerce Board, Community Futures, those, things like that? Those are handled through separate agreements with those nonprofits. Okay. Okay. Those are, those are their governing boards. That so I think you've just answered this, but just so it's crystal clear for me. So then these committees, the Assessment Review Board, the Subdivision uh, Board, and then the Regional Emergency Board, there is legislation in place that we are required to have. Yeah, those. and so we have, yeah, we have those. Yeah, so SDAB is under the Act, ARB, those are for any appeals that may come from members of the public, whether they be over a development permit or an assessment. Um, so we are required under legislation. So those are non-negotiable standing committees? Yeah. Okay. Jonathan, I have a question because I did sit on the assessment review board and um, they have a pool of individuals that are trained and I actually did some for MD of Rocky View, for County of Wheatland and different areas um, rather than having your own people because there's such limited amounts of assessment hearings. So it might save you on because you have to pay for all the training, the mileage, everything. That, yeah, that's a very good point. Under our bylaw, I think, uh, actually in the terms of reference, it lays out how much we pay for, for training. If it's a half day session, they get X amount. Full day, they get X amount. So um, there is something, I think we'd have a regional agreement that we're just wanting to kind of firm up a little bit to see if that is something that we can proceed with. But it's a good idea for sure to have a, a regional pool. Councillor Wiley. 
So then uh, this question really is just for the rest of council. If we're considering bringing in a multicultural committee, and so that's back to Schedule D, um, I am afraid the steps on the toes of the Vault Cultural Collective, which as we saw when they came in has dozens of volunteers and they're ready to hit the ground running. And under that umbrella organization, they are bringing in multicultural groups. So I'm wondering if there's, instead of creating our own standing committee, there's a way we could look at better working with them. Just, just for my clarification, Councillor Wally, um, the Vault Collective, are they, are they focused on arts and the various cultures in community? The, the, reason I, the reason I had suggested this was we had done so much, we had done so much as council to council meetings and, and working with Siksika uh, Council. And during the discussions, we started to say, well, what about other cultures in the community? If, if we're addressing the concerns and uh, worries of Siksika people in our community and we're not paying any attention to other cultures who may be suffering similar or maybe very uh, different problems in our, in our community, um, is, it, it's, is, is it something that we would like to start some work on as well? So I'm not sure if the mandate of the vault would be similar to what we were thinking of at that time regarding a possible multicultural committee, culturalism committee. Deputy Mayor? Yeah, I, I follow that, Your Worship, and in our, our um, long-standing work with Siksika, we've discussed this with them as well in terms of, uh, of um, developing uh, sort of as a second step to, to the uh, um, Strathmore Siksika anti-racism uh, work that we've done. But I think, I think that more than this is our, our community has grown, that there's, a, there's um, huge benefits just beyond the, um, you know, fostering awareness and understanding of our multicultural population at this point. I think that there's a, there's a, a need to really think about how, how, um, how our community can really work to attract um, multicultural populations. And I think that uh, that if we want to draw multicultural populations to our community, and we want to see our community continue to grow and thrive, there's some real uh, benefits to initiating, facilitating discussion around existing and, and uh, emerging issues. And and uh, you know that's also talking about possibilities. It's it's identifying barriers. I think that. Um, implementing a multiculturalism strategy uh, also relates to what Councillor Wiley talked about. I think that there's all kinds of opportunities to involve our school populations in this, to think about other institutions that exist within our community, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce or, or, um, or our seniors uh, community. You know, how do we make this a community that people of all cultures, all races, all nationalities, that they want to come here. So it's in building a sustainable committee that we, you know, that we foster that uh, that capacity for multicultural diversity and and uh, and hopefully um, build a, a stronger community through that. And I guess if I can add, um, this this concept of a multicultural uh, committee to deal with is to potential issues. Um, you know, it would be things like hearing from a representative uh, from the Filipino community. They might have some, some concepts or some plans or some concerns even that would then come to this committee and I could, whoever was on the committee could bring it back to council. Or for example, I had a resident stop me at the uh, flea market uh, boot sale. Is that what it was basically? Anyway, he said that we have a Ukrainian couple uh, who are here uh, what, the husband is a is a trained engineer, and his wife is a teacher, and they're trying to find employment, but their English, his English is is quite low at this point. They're taking courses, so perhaps that would come to our committee, and we could, you know, we could brainstorm or come up with uh, supports or systems or um, things that they could do help for them. It is that's kind of what we were thinking about this regarding this committee. Councillor Wiley, did you want to 
add anything or ask any other questions? Yeah, so when the Cultural Collective, and listen to their name, the Vault Cultural Collective came out, they, they had really paid attention and they focused on this. They read our cultural and recreation plan and they really stressed that they were trying to become the cultural umbrella organization that we talked about in that, in that plan. Also, I, I couldn't find it in here, but I'm sure it's in our strategic plan to support grassroots organizations. So it seems to me like we have this like vibrant, up and running group that's ready to go. And I know they're courting the Filipino community specifically as one. I know they're trying to outreach to Sitsika. And this is something that they're super excited about. And then in comes government. And it seems like we're gonna try and set up on our own something that our community is already doing. Um, I and, think and it would I definitely would be, be worth talking to them and saying yeah. like, so here's the mandate we're envisioning. Does this overlap with you? To what extent? Is this something you guys could take on? How can we support you? It just seems like we're trying to do something that's already exists with this huge community mm -hmm. group. I'd, I'd be more than willing to, to go into a holding pattern to see how things progress with the vault um, cultural aspect of that, of that uh, uh, organization. I, I would be absolutely fine with that. And as you said, if the grassroots can and wants to do something in their level i'm i'm all in i'm all in as far as supporting them so i'd be i'd be more than willing to go into a holding pattern and, and see how things are and as for the education um melissa and i are both on the library committee that's something that the library would be very happy to get recommendations to have people come in and and work with them and Sounds to be good. clear, uh, we have a number of Ukrainian families already attending the library yeah. and utilizing the SAIL program yes, uh, to work on their en English as, uh, as a second language. Good. Thank you. So uh, everyone's comfortable with, uh, no. with that approach? No. 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 You aren't? You are. <laughs> you, you, do, you are the other way. Okay. So I have uh, Councillor Langmaid and then Councillor Deputy Mayor Peterson. Um, Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, I, I, I would not be in favor of, of uh, sending this off to the Vault Cultural Collective. Uh, with all, all respect and, and admiration for the work that they do in our community, I think the, the importance of making sure that we are listening to all of our residents and that we are hearing you know, cross-cultural concerns about our community, that to me is is a key part of, of my role here on council and, and, and it's making sure that, you know, even, even community members that are, are members of a much smaller cultural group still have representation at the table and still have the ear of this council. And I think, um, well, uh, like I said, I, I do very much value the work that the Vault Cultural Collective is doing. I think that's a, a slightly different mandate. And for me, I. For me, what, it's really important that, that council take this on, that we own this, that this is something that we are dedicated to, that, 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 that this council makes a commitment to, and that we are dedicated to making sure that this is, you know, we are, we are intentionally building communities. We are intentionally working within our community to identify how we can improve it for even the most marginalized person. Um, and, and to that end, I, I, I think I would actually argue that this committee actually doesn't go far enough um, by the given terms of reference. We have a multiculturalism committee and in the mandate it specifically says this is an inclusive community for all races, but you can have a culture that is not defined around race. And, uh, and, and there, are, there are a number of them, you know, you, you think about different religious communities, religious cultures, um, you know, the Sikh community, uh, you have the, uh, the disabled community in town, uh, you have uh, LGBT, the LGBTQ community, which uh, is frequent, uh, frequently experiences marginalization but isn't included in the terms of reference um, for this potential committee. Um, I, I, I think it's, I think this is key to our work to anti-racism. I think establishing this committee under the auspices of, the, of this council, and uh, you know, as 
as a motion made by this council and, and supported by this council, I, I, I think that supports, supports the work we do and will support the relationship that we're working to build and continuing to build with Siksika and all other communities, um, all other different cultures and cultural communities within Strathmore. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Langmaid. Um, Jonathan, from a, a procedural point then, if there was enough uh, interest on council to carry on with this multiculturalism committee, uh, would it then come forward at a later date or would we, um, we wouldn't necessarily do it tonight, but we could have it added to another meeting? What, what's the best procedure forward if enough of council feel the way Councillor Langmaid feels? So, um, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we're going to be bringing this bylaw to the October 5th regular council meeting. In the meantime, if, uh, if it is the will of council, we probably need to create a policy to go with this terms of reference for the reasons you just outlined. There's um, probably actions that we would want to really set the terms out and the parameters of what this committee could and could not do. Um, the goal would be to bring it on the 5th, if that's the will of council, but it may be delayed a couple of weeks, depending on depending on how the conversations around the administration of this committee would, would go. Okay, thank you. Um, and we obviously would want to get it right if this is what council wants to do. So I don't think we're in a time crunch as far as this has to be done by October 5th, but we can definitely begin more discussions on it. Councillor Mitzner. Uh, you worship, I'm sorry, Kevin just wants to hold Sorry, Kevin. Okay. Well, okay, well, thank you. Uh, I didn't mean to, to butt in here. Um, I mean, another option you have is in the corporate business plan, we, we have a, a, a diversity and inclusion um, program or plan development. I mean, so an option is you, you can amend a bylaw at any time. So, you know, what, I guess what I'm suggesting is one option is we could do some more work on diversity and inclusion and we could bring something back preliminarily in, in short order in the next couple months, you know, probably before the year end. And that might help inform council about what direction you want to go in terms of a committee and, and what its terms of references may be. Uh, that's just an option. Uh, I mean, it's just another thing on the table. That sounds, uh, that sounds interesting. Councillor Mitzner and then Deputy Mayor Peterson. Um, I believe that if council maintains uh, an open concept uh, to all, for all conversations and concerns with all residents, I don't think we need a separate committee. Where are you going to stop and start and how many cultures and how many members are going to be on this committee? Thank you. Well, as, as far as the number of members on the committee, that would come up in the terms of reference. But yeah, you know, and, and obviously you could be looking at a, a large variety of things to consider. Um, and that's something we'd have to decide on as a council if we're, if we're going to go for this or not. Deputy Mayor Peterson. Thank you, Worship. So, so I think that for me, uh, in in terms of uh, having the art, the vault, cultural collective, is um, a part of it, but it's not the maybe the essence of it. And when I think about the um, the work that the precursors to the vault, I was very involved with the Wheatland Society of the Arts, and then sat on as a council representative on what was Strathmore Regional Arts Committee. And, um, and I think that they have a part to play, a role to play, but they wouldn't be the vehicle that would, that would drive this. The people that have come to me about, about being interested in a multicultural um, uh, committee or, or a standing committee are, are the um, are builders, they are developers, they are business people within the community that are looking for um, the, the real economic spin-offs that come from having a, a very, very diverse community. And, and so if, if we want to stay exactly the way we are, then we wouldn't need to do anything. Then we could just stay the course and not have any committee. Or we could put together a committee whose mandate it would be to um, advise council and work with all of those you know whether it's a chamber of commerce or or whether it's um, you know the the vault cultural collective 
all of those people that, that could lend themselves to, you know, builders and developers to uh, devising a process that would lend itself to this. And I think about cities that have used it so effectively in, in, in building a, a really strong foundation uh, that, that relates to culture and economics. Uh, communities like Langley and Coquitlam and, and um, others in that that I've looked at in terms of how they developed their multiculturalism program. And it has, it has enriched their cities. Chestermere is another really good example. And the committee work that they've done in terms of the diversity in their community has, has uh, lent itself to, to uh, unprecedented growth. So I think that having council review this, um, you know, not just from an arts perspective, not just from a race or ethnicity perspective, but from the broadest possible perspective as to how it will help to build our community and make our community stronger, better, and more attractive. I, th I really think that there's benefit in, in moving this forward. And it's not something that we, that we necessarily own. It's something that we do from our governance perspective to help build this community. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Wiley, then Councillor Montgomery. Well, I think we all agree we want to make the community better, stronger, you know, those are all the goals of all of us. The question is, can government do a better job of it than the community itself? Like, how can we build an intentional community better than the community? So my question is, is how can we support the groups that currently exist and, and let, them, let them come up with the proposals? So take the Filipino society, which they have a Filipino society in town. Like if any of them are watching this tonight, they're wondering like, where have you been for us for all these years? How can you support us? But now we're talking about setting up our own committee. It's like, how are we outreaching to them? So, and, and I would just go back to the vault. I think that they, they, that is their goal and that is their mandate is to build a cultural collective and not just an art gallery. The art gallery is almost like their storefront for their ambitions. Thank you, Councillor Wiley. I know in, in talking with um, some of the representatives from the Filipino Association and other groups, um, they have been, to me, they've been quite excited that the town is willing to be at the head of this and to, to bring it forward. The, the feelings that have been given to me is, you, you guys, your town actually cares about our uh, different cultures and you're taking the lead on this. They're, the ones who've talked to me have said they're quite appreciative of that. So uh, it's something that we can, and we'll talk again about procedure after this discussion, Jonathan. We can see where we might go with this or how to best proceed. Uh, Councillor Montgomery. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we're I think we're kind of premature right now to include this in the bylaw, um, simply because like there's there's obviously some debate about whether it should be focused on culture, uh, whether it should be focused on you know some sort of uh, race or, or skin tone aspect, uh, whether it should include uh, you know groups like LGBT or or other uh, groups. Um, so I think that we need to probably have a separate debate and even just kind of a debate and, and clarify what exactly we want this, you know, this committee to, to do. You know, is it going to be anti-racism? Is it going to be just cultural promotion? Um, and, and we'll have to, I guess, yeah, so I, I think it's premature at this point to include it uh, for the upcoming meeting anyways. And, uh, and yeah, I look forward to the debate anyways when this comes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Montgomery. So, Jonathan, again, what's our best path forward? And and Kevin. I uh, thank your worship. Uh, just hearing the debate tonight, maybe the simplest thing to, would be to bring the bylaw without Schedule D to October 5th. That way we can start putting out some advertisements for the vacancies and hopefully get people appointed for the October 26th organizational meeting. And then when it comes to the multiculturalism committee and, and diversity work that we're doing, I think I might not be the best person to ask on that. It'd probably be worthwhile to bring that whole potential program to a committee of the whole to really kind of hash out what we want it to be for reasons that you guys already stated. Um, what, what are the parameters of the would potential it, committee? Would and, it be appropriate then if we're going to have it come back to a committee of the whole to discuss it in a full and fulsome, fulsome way um, would we make a make an announcement or a, 
uh, something on, on our town's Facebook page to encourage people who may be interested in this committee to come forward and be a part of the gallery, the, the uh, crowd in here, the attendees? I guess, uh, for what purpose? Would you want feedback? Well, I guess, it, I'm, I guess I'd be looking for input from people as to what they might want, keeping in mind Councillor Langmaid and Deputy Mayor's comments, uh, Councillor Wiley's comments. Um, everything I've heard tonight, you know, Councillor Mitzner, we'd hear from the people that this potentially matters the most to. Maybe it's a survey. I don't know what it is, but uh, we would definitely uh, do do well with a, a good full discussion on this. Councillor Langley? Uh, thank you. Just, uh, I would have absolutely, uh, any member of the public is always welcome to come join us at any of our meetings, obviously. Um, I'm not sure that there's a reason to give this particular uh, schedule any more or really less advertising than the others. Um, sometimes, and, I, and I'm thinking back to a previous council specifically on, a, on the prohibited business bylaw that was passed prior to my time on this council I think sometimes uh, acting in, a, in an overly cautious manner can, can invite, it can invite a community to, be, to become involved in something that perhaps might not have been a concern for them previously. If when when we highlight, we you know I think it's important to understand the, the the impact that council can have on a community by the perception of what we're bringing forward, and and when we bring these items forward, and and we put a an emphasis on one more than another or. You know, especially in terms of of subjects like this, I I, th I think what you run the risk of of doing is is really just uh, potentially poking some uh, poking some bears, and I think, as I said, well, well, I'm always happy to invite any member of the public in to become involved in in what we do here in council chambers. Um, I, I'm not sure that there's, I'm, I'm not sure I understand why this would require special um, advertisement. I'm, I'm not sure what, it, I, I mean, if we're looking for feedback on the terms of reference, sure, but if we're, if we're looking on feedback of whether or not we need this, you, you are opening, you're opening an invite for some terribly hateful feedback, potentially. And I just want us to be cautious about that because we did see that happen in this community with previous bylaws. I'm wondering if council would agree then to uh, the concept that Jonathan presented that uh, we look at passing the bylaw excluding this and that at a future council meeting we, we have it come up as one item, multiculturalism committee, and we can fully discuss it and see if we want to progress with that committee. And then we then you guys can go back and try to figure out terms of reference, draft a bylaw, or add an, ad, an amendment to the bylaw to include it as a potential committee. Does that make sense to people? And, and to okay. be, just to clarify, it's not that I don't want the public's feedback. Yeah. It, it's that I think the decision of whether or not we do this comes down to us as a council. And once we decide uh, no or go, that's when I would really love to have the community come in and, and hear what they want, you know, what do they want as an outcome should this committee be uh, approved by council. That's John, Jonathan and then Councillor Wiley. I uh, so, uh, thank your worship. Just going back to your question, just now I understand where you're coming from. On our regular council meeting agendas, we do have a heading for public comments. So when this item does come back, members of the public are always welcome to speak to any item that's on the agenda. So at that moment, they could definitely 
um, provide their feedback as well. They, I think they have five minutes according to our procedure bylaw. Okay, thank you. So I, I think from looking around, council seemed comfortable with uh, passing the bylaw concerning all the, all the other committees that we've discussed and then coming back to focus solely on the multiculturalism committee. Councillor Wiley. Yeah, I just want to ask one request from administration then when they bring the, the discussion about the multicultural committee to us. I just want a little bit more information. I'm wondering if like, for example, when we were learning about the handy bus, weren't there some letters that came in supporting the handy bus, something like that? Is there a way that you guys could seek out some of the community groups like the Filipino Society and just say, can you give us a letter I don't know, like, or would you even do a delegate? I don't know, but just give us a sense of what it is you're looking for, or are we opening a whole can of worms there? Like, it's just, that's the information I'd like. I'd like to hear from the vault saying, actually, that's not really part of our mandate, but we would totally support this, or other organizations that are already existing in town, just giving us a sense of, like, does this meet their needs? I'd like to hear from them, maybe not a survey, but letters, or? Your Worship, can I just respond to, to Councillor Wadi. When we were doing our strategic planning, Councillor Langmaid identified an issue, and, and you're going to maybe have to help me with this, but identified an issue in our last community-based survey that there was an underrepresented group. And, and so I think that's useful information too to, to bring into that whole discussion, you know, to, uh, because it is it does provide some, um, some data-based, uh, understanding, but I appreciate that, Councillor Wiley, I like that idea. And if I could add something just for administration and, and Jonathan, maybe when this comes back to us, like it, it, we should try to, I think it could be a long discussion, so I'm wondering if we, if we could be cognizant of having it added to a light agenda for that night, if, if that makes sense. If we have a meeting that looks like it has a light agenda, there's no rush, let's, let's make sure that we can devote the time and get it right. Councillor Langmaid. Jonathan, do you have a fairly clear idea of where we're headed and what we're trying to do in a future meeting? And then this will, the bylaw itself that deals with these boards and committees will come on October 5th, correct? That's correct. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. We have. I think we have a couple amendments to do when we bring it back, but they seem pretty small. So we'll okay. definitely aim to bring it back on October fifth. All right. Thank you very much. So we can now move on to question and answer period. Anybody have any questions and answers? I just. I just have a, a brief question, Your Worship, uh, for for administration. Um, some time ago, you know, probably, and it might precede your time here. Uh, a group in the community uh, came to ask about. Um, having access to water to flood their, their community-based pond. And I don't need an answer tonight, but I know that with uh, um, winter approaching, that this will become uh, an issue again, and probably for some of our other ponds, and I know Mark is intensely aware of this, but uh, just uh, you know, for a discussion at a future date, and, and I think it fits into some of the other planning that you've been doing, and uh, uh, the community probably be looking for an update but I, I don't need an answer tonight at all. But, and the second thing, Your Worship, if I might have your indulgence. Oh, I'm sorry. The second thing is, no, no, I just want to have, I have two things. The second thing is that uh, it's come to my attention that the Legion, the Strathmore Legion Number 10 Ladies Auxiliary is going to be celebrating their 75th anniversary. And I was, uh, I, I don't know what they, what they have planned or uh, if they have any huge events planned, but, uh, I was uh, thinking that maybe our, our comms could reach out to them just in terms of, uh, of um, bringing to the attention of the community all the, the great things that that committee does. We, they're, they're very um, understated in the work that they do, but they, they do a tremendous amount of work in our community. And I just thought it'd be a, just a, a really nice shout out on their 75th anniversary to be able to recognize the, uh, the extraordinary contribution they've made for 75 years and I'm sure will continue to make. And that's all I have, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so at this time, we're looking for a motion to go in camera to, deal, to, uh, to have the CAO Council dialogue. Councillor Langmaid. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'd like to move the council move in camera to discuss an item related to Section 24.1a of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act at 9 p.m. Thank you. You've all heard the motion. All in favor? Motion is carried. And 